Section 25 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, recording by Avai in December 2010. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Burke Asenwine. Chapter 25 Influencing the Crowd success in business in the last analysis turns upon touching the imagination of crowds the reason that preachers in this present generation are less successful in getting people to want goodness than businessmen are in getting them to want motor cars hats and pianolas is that businessmen as a class are more close and desperate students of human nature and have boned down harder to the art of touching the imaginations of the crowds. Gerald Stanley Lee, Crowds In the early part of July 1914, a collection of Frenchmen in Paris or Germans in Berlin was not a crowd in a psychological sense. Each individual had his own special interests and needs, and there was no powerful common idea to unify them. A group then represented only a collection of individuals. A month later, any collection of Frenchmen or Germans formed a crowd. Patriotism, hate, a common fear, a pervasive grief had unified the individuals. The psychology of the crowd is far different from the psychology of the personal members that compose it. The crowd is a distinct entity. Individuals restrain and subdue many of their impulses at the dictates of reason. The crowd never reasons, it only feels. As persons, there is a sense of responsibility attached to our actions, which checks many of our incitements, but the sense of responsibility is lost in the crowd because of its numbers. The crowd is exceedingly suggestible and will act upon the wildest and most extreme ideas. The crowd mind is primitive and will cheer plans and perform actions which its members would utterly repudiate. A mob is only a highly wrought crowd. Ruskin's description is fitting. You can talk a mob into anything. Its feelings may be, usually are, on the whole generous and right, but it has no foundation for them, no hold of them. You may tease or tickle it into anything at your pleasure. It thinks by infection, for the most part, catching an opinion like a cold, and there is nothing so little that it will not roar itself wild about when the fit is on, nothing so great, but it will forget in an hour when the fit is past. History will show us how the crowd mind works. The medieval mind was not given to reasoning, the medieval man attached great weight to the utterance of authority, his religion touched chiefly the emotions. These conditions provided a rich soil for the propagation of the crowd mind, when in the eleventh century flagellation, a voluntary self-scourging, was preached by the monks. Substituting flagellation for reciting penitential psalms was advocated by the reformers, a scale was drawn up, making 1,000 strokes equivalent to 10 psalms, or 15,000 to the entire psalter. This craze spread by leaps and crowds. Flagellant fraternities sprang up. Priests carrying banners led through the streets great processions reciting prayers and whipping their bloody bodies with leaden thongs fitted with four iron points. Pope Clement denounced this practice, and several of the leaders of those processions had to be burned at the stake before the frenzy could be uprooted. All Western and Central Europe was turned into a crowd by the preaching of the Crusaders, and millions of the followers of the Prince of Peace rushed to the Holy Land to kill the heathen. Even the children started on a crusade against the Saracens. The mob spirit was so strong that home affections and persuasion could not prevail against it, and thousands of mere babes died in their attempts to reach and redeem the sacred sepulchre. In the early part of the 18th century, the South Sea Company was formed in England. Britain became a speculative crowd. 
stock in the south sea company rose from one hundred twenty eight one half points in january to five hundred fifty in may and scored one thousand in july five million shares were sold at this premium speculation ran riot hundreds of companies were organized one was formed for a wheel of perpetual motion another never troubled to give any reason at all for taking the cash of its subscribers it merely announced that it was organized for a design which will hereafter be promulgated owners began to sell the mob caught the suggestion a panic ensued the south sea company stock fell eight hundred points in a few days and more than a billion dollars evaporated in this era of frenzied speculation the burning of the witches at salem the klondike gold craze and the forty-eight people who were killed by mobs in the united states in nineteen thirteen are examples familiar to us in america the crowd must have a leader the leader of the crowd or mob is its determining factor he becomes self-hypnotized with the idea that unifies its members his enthusiasm is contagious and so is theirs the crowd acts as he suggests the great mass of people do not have any very sharply drawn conclusions on any subject outside of their own little spheres but when they become a crowd they are perfectly willing to accept ready-made hand-me-down opinions they will follow a leader at all costs in labor troubles they often follow a leader in preference to obeying their government in war they will throw self-preservation to the bushes and follow a leader in the face of guns that fire fourteen times a second the mob becomes shorn of will-power and blindly obedient to its dictator the russian government recognizing the menace of the crowd mind to its autocracy formally prohibited public gatherings history is full of similar instances how the crowd is created today the crowd is as real a factor in our socialized life as our magnates and monopolies it is too complex a problem merely to damn or praise it it must be reckoned with and mastered the present problem is how to get the most and the best out of the crowd spirit and the public speaker finds this to be peculiarly his own question his influence is multiplied if he can only transmute his audience into a crowd his affirmations must be their conclusions this can be accomplished by unifying the minds and needs of the audience and arousing their emotions their feelings not their reason must be played upon it is up to him to do this nobly argument has its place on the platform but even its potencies must subserve the speaker's plan of attack to win possession of his audience reread the chapter on feeling and enthusiasm it is impossible to make an audience a crowd without appealing to their emotions can you imagine the average group becoming a crowd while hearing a lecture on dry fly fishing or on egyptian art on the other hand it would not have required world famous eloquence to have turned any audience in ulster in nineteen fourteen into a crowd by discussing the home rule act the crowd spirit depends largely on the subject used to fuse their individualities into one glowing whole note how antony played upon the feelings of his hearers in the famous funeral oration given by shakespeare in julius caesar from murmuring units the men became a unit a mob antony's oration over caesar's body friends romans countrymen lend me your ears i come to bury caesar not to praise him the evil that men do lives after them the good is oft interred with their bones so let it be with caesar the noble brutus hath told you caesar was ambitious if it were so it was a grievous fault and grievously hath caesar answered it here on the leave of brutus and the rest for brutus is an honourable man so are they all all honourable men come i to speak in caesar's funeral 
he was my friend faithful and just to me but brutus says he was ambitious and brutus is an honourable man he hath brought many captives home to rome whose ransom did the general coffers fill did this in caesar seem ambitious when that the poor have cried caesar hath wept ambition should be made of sterner stuff yet brutus says he was ambitious and brutus is an honourable man you all did see that on the lupercal i thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse was this ambition yet brutus says he was ambitious and sure he is an honourable man i speak not to disprove what brutus spoke but here i am to speak what i do know you all did love him once not without cause what cause withholds you then to mourn for him o oh, judgment thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason bear with me my heart is in the coffin there with caesar and i must pause till it come back to me weeps first plebeian methinks there is much reason in his sayings second plebeian if thou consider rightly of the matter caesar has had great wrong third plebeian has he masters i fear there will a worse come in his place fourth plebeian mark ye his words he would not take the crown therefore tis certain he was not ambitious first plebeian if it be found so some will dear abide it second plebeian poor soul his eyes are red as fire with weeping third plebeian there is not a nobler man in rome than anthony fourth plebeian now mark him he begins again to speak antony but yesterday the word of caesar might have stood against the world now lies he there and none so poor to do him reverence o oh, masters if i were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage i should do brutus wrong and cassius wrong who you all know are honourable men i will not do them wrong i rather choose to wrong the dead to wrong myself and you than i will wrong such honourable men but here's a parchment with the seal of caesar i found it in his closet tis his will let but the commons hear this testament which pardon me i do not mean to read and they would go and kiss dead caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood yea beg a hair of him for memory and dying mention it within their wills bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue fourth plebeian will hear the will read it mark antony all the will the will we will hear caesar's will antony have patience gentle friends i must not read it it is not meet you know how caesar loved you you are not wood you are not stones but men and being men hearing the will of caesar it will inflame you it will make you mad tis good you know not that you are his heirs for if you should oh what would come of it fourth plebeian read the will will hear it antony you shall read us the will caesar's will antony will you be patient will you stay a while i have overshot myself to tell you of it i fear i wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed caesar i do fear it fourth plebeian they were traitors <laughs> honourable men all the will the testament second plebeian they were villains murderers the will read the will antony you will compel me then to read the will then make a ring about the corpse of caesar and let me show you him that made the will shall i descend and will you give me leave all come down second plebeian descend he comes down from the rostrum third plebeian you shall have leave fourth plebeian a 
A ring, stand round. First plebeian. Stand from the hearse, stand from the body. Second plebeian. Room for Antony, most noble Antony. Antony. Nay, press not so upon me, stand far off. All. Stand back, room, bear back. Antony. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. Twas on a summer's evening in his tent, that day he overcame the nervy. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if brutus so unkindly knocked or no for brutus as you know was caesar's angel judge o oh you gods how caesar loved him this was the most unkindest cut of all for when the noble caesar saw him stab ingratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls! what weep you when you but behold our caesar's vesture wounded look you here he is himself marred as you see by traitors first plebeian o oh, piteous spectacle second plebeian o oh, noble caesar third plebeian o oh, woeful day fourth plebeian o oh, traitors villains first plebeian O oh, most bloody sight! Second plebeian, we will be revenged. All, revenge, about, seek, burn, fire, kill, day. Let not a traitor live. Antony, stay, countrymen. First plebeian, peace there, hear the noble Antony. Second plebeian, we'll hear him, we'll follow him will die with him antony good friends sweet friends let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny they that have done this deed are honourable what private griefs they have alas i know not that made them do it they are wise and honourable and will no doubt with reasons answer you i come not friends to steal away your hearts I am no orator as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain blunt man, that love my friend, and that they know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit nor worth, action or utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on, I tell you that which you yourselves do know, show your sweet caesar's wounds poor poor dumb mouths and bid them speak for me but were i brutus and brutus antony there were an antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of caesar that should move the stones of rome to rise and mutiny all will mutiny first plebeian will burn the house of brutus third plebeian away then come seek the conspirators antony yet hear me countrymen yet hear me speak all peace ho hear antony most noble antony antony why friends you go to do you know not what wherein hath caesar thus deserved your loves alas you know not i must tell you then you have forgot the will I told you of. Plebeians. Most true, the will. Let's stay and hear the will. Antony. 
here is the will and under caesar's seal to every roman citizen he gives to every several man seventy-five drachmas second plebeian most noble caesar will revenge his death third plebeian o royal caesar antony hear me with patience all peace ho antony moreover he hath left you all his walks his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side tiber he hath left them you and to your heirs forever common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves here was a caesar when comes such another first plebeian never never come away away will burn his body in the holy place and with the bronze fire the traitor's houses take up the body second plebeian go fetch fire third plebeian pluck down benches third plebeian pluck down benches fourth plebeian pluck down forms windows anything excellent citizens with the body antony now let it work mischief thou art afoot take thou what curse thou wilt to unify single auditors into a crowd express their common needs aspirations dangers and emotions deliver your message so that the interests of one shall appear to be the interests of all the conviction of one man is intensified in proportion as he finds others sharing his belief and feeling antony does not stop with telling the roman populace that caesar fell he makes the tragedy universal then i and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us applause generally a sign of feeling helps to unify an audience the nature of the crowd is illustrated by the contagion of applause recently a throng in a new york moving picture and vaudeville house had been applauding several songs and when an advertisement for tailored skirts was thrown on the screen someone started the applause and the crowd like sheep blindly imitated until someone saw the joke and laughed then the crowd again followed the leader and laughed at and applauded its own stupidity actors sometimes start applause for their lines by snapping their fingers someone in the first few rows will mistake it for faint applause and the whole theatre will chime in an observant auditor will be interested in noticing the various devices a monologist will use to get the first round of laughter and applause he works so hard because he knows an audience of units is an audience of indifferent critics but once get them to laughing together and each single laughter sweeps a number of others with them until the whole theatre is a roar and the entertainer has scored these are meretricious schemes to be sure and do not savour in the least of inspiration but crowds have not changed in their nature in a thousand years and the one law holds for the greatest preacher and the pettiest stump speaker you must fuse your audience or they will not warm to your message the devices of the great orator may not be so obvious as those of the vaudeville monologist but the principle is the same he tries to strike some universal note that will have all his hearers feeling alike at the same time the evangelist knows this when he has the soloist sing some touching song just before the address or he will have the entire congregation sing and that is the psychology of now everybody sing for he knows that they who will not join in the song are as yet outside the crowd many a time has the popular evangelist stopped in the middle of his talk when he felt that his hearers were units instead of a molten mass and a sensitive speaker can feel that condition most depressingly and suddenly demanded that every one arise and sing or repeat aloud a familiar passage or read in unison or perhaps he has subtly left the thread of his discourse to tell a story that from long experience he knew would not fail to bring his hearers to a common feeling 
these things are important resources for the speaker and happy is he who uses them worthily and not as a despicable charlatan the difference between a demagogue and a leader is not so much a matter of method as of principle even the most dignified speaker must recognize the eternal laws of human nature you are by no means urged to become a trickster on the platform far from it but don't kill your speech with dignity to be icily correct is as silly as to rant do neither but appeal to those world-old elements in your audience that have been recognized by all great speakers from demosthenes to sam small and see to it that you never debase your powers by arousing your hearers unworthily it is as hard to kindle enthusiasm in a scattered audience as to build a fire with scattered sticks an audience to be converted into a crowd must be made to appear as a crowd this cannot be done when they are widely scattered over a large seating space or when many empty benches separate the speaker from his hearers have your audience seated compactly how many a preacher has bemoaned the enormous edifice over which what would normally be a large congregation has scattered in chilled and chilling solitude sunday after sunday bishop brooks himself could not have inspired a congregation of one thousand souls seated in the vastness of st peter's at rome in that colossal sanctuary it is only on great occasions which bring out the multitudes that the service is before the high altar at other times the smaller side chapels are used universal ideas surcharged with feeling help to create the crowd atmosphere examples liberty character righteousness courage fraternity altruism country and national heroes George Cohen was making psychology practical and profitable when he introduced the flag and flag songs into his musical comedies. Cromwell's regiments prayed before the battle and went into the fight singing hymns. The French corps, singing the Marseillaise in 1914, charged the Germans as one man. Such unifying devices arouse the feelings, make soldiers fanatical mobs, and alas more efficient murderers end of section twenty five section twenty six of the art of public speaking this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by paul adams the Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Essenwein Chapter 26 Riding the Winged Horse To think and to feel constitute the two grand divisions of men of genius, the men of reasoning and the men of imagination. Isaac Disraeli, Literary Character of Men of Genius and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes, and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream It is common among those who deal chiefly with life's practicalities to think of imagination as having little value in comparison with direct thinking, they smile with tolerance when emerson says that science does not know its debt to the imagination for these are the words of a speculative essayist a philosopher a poet but when napoleon the indomitable welder of empires declares that the human race is governed by its imagination the authoritative word commands their respect be it remembered the faculty of forming mental images is as efficient a cog as may be found in the whole mind-machine. True, it must fit into that other vital cog, pure thought, but when it does so it may be questioned which is the more productive of important results for the happiness and well-being of man. This should become more apparent as we go on. 1. What is imagination? 
Let us not seek for a definition, for a score of varying ones may be found, but let us grasp this fact. By imagination we mean either the faculty or the process of forming mental images. The subject matter of imagination may be really existent in nature, or not at all real, or a combination of both. It may be physical, or spiritual, or both. The mental image is at once the most lawless and the most law-abiding child that has ever been born of the mind. First of all, as its name suggests, the process of imagination, for we are thinking of it now as a process rather than as a faculty, is memory at work. Therefore we must consider it primarily as 1. Reproductive imagination. We see or hear or feel or taste or smell something, and the sensation passes away. Yet we are conscious of a greater or lesser ability to reproduce such feelings at will. Two considerations, in general, will govern the vividness of the image thus evoked, the strength of the original impression and the reproductive power of one mind as compared with another. Yet every normal person will be able to evoke images with some degree of clearness. The fact that not all minds possess this imaging faculty in anything like equal measure will have an important bearing on the public speaker's study of this question. No man who does not feel at least some poetic impulses is likely to aspire seriously to be a poet. Yet many whose imaging faculties are so dormant as to seem actually dead do aspire to be public speakers. To all such we say most earnestly, awaken your image-making gift, for even in the most coldly logical discourse it is sure to prove of great service. It is important that you find out at once just how full and how trustworthy is your imagination, for it is capable of cultivation as well as of abuse. Francis Gorton, footnote, inquiries into human faculty, Francis Galton says, The French appear to possess the visualizing faculty in a high degree. The peculiar ability they show in prearranging ceremonials and fates of all kinds, and their undoubted genius for tactics and strategy, show that they are able to foresee effects with unusual clearness. Their ingenuity in all technical contrivances is an additional testimony in the same direction and so is their singular clearness of expression. Their phrase, figurez-vous, or picture to yourself, seems to express their dominant mode of perception. Our equivalent of image is ambiguous. But individuals differ in this respect, just as markedly as, for instance, the Dutch do from the French. And this is true not only of those who are classified by their friends as being respectively imaginative or unimaginative, but of those whose gifts or habits are not well known. Let us take for experiment six of the best-known types of imaging and see in practice how they arise in our own minds. By all odds the most common type is A, the visual image. Children who more readily recall things seen than things heard are called by psychologists eye-minded, and most of us are bent in this direction. Close your eyes now and recall, the word thus hyphenated is more suggestive, the scene around this morning's breakfast table. Possibly there was nothing striking in the situation, and the image is therefore not striking. Then image any notable table scene in your experience, how vividly it stands forth, because at the time you felt the impression strongly. Just then you may not have been conscious of how strongly the scene was laying hold upon you, for often we are so intent upon what we see that we give no particular thought to the fact that it is impressing us. It may surprise you to learn how accurately you are able to image a scene when a long time has elapsed between the conscious focusing of your attention on the image and the time when you saw the original. b. The auditory image is probably the next most vivid of our recalled experiences. Here association is potent to suggest similarities. Close out all the world beside, and listen to the peculiar wood-against-wood wood sound of the sharp thunder among rocky mountains. The crash of ball against ten-pins may suggest it. Or image, 
The word is imperfect, for it seems to suggest only the eye. The sound of tearing ropes when some precious weight hangs in danger. Or recall the bay of a hound almost upon you in pursuit. Choose your own sound and see how pleasantly or terribly real it becomes when imaged in your brain. C. The motor image is a close competitor with the auditory for second place. Have you ever awakened in the night, every muscle taut and striving, to feel yourself straining against the opposing football line that held like a stone wall, or as firmly as the headboard of your bed? Or voluntarily recall the movement of the boat when you cried inwardly, It's all up with me! The perilous lurch of a train, the sudden sinking of an elevator, or the unexpected toppling of a rocking chair may serve as further experiments. D. The gustatory image is common enough, as the idea of eating lemons will testify. Sometimes the pleasurable recollection of a delightful dinner will cause the mouth to water years afterward, or the image of particularly atrocious medicine will wrinkle the nose long after it has made one day in boyhood wretched. D. The olfactory image is even more delicate. Some there are who are affected to illness by the memory of certain odours, while others experience the most delectable sensations by the rise of pleasing olfactory images. F. The tactile image, to name no others, is well nigh as potent. Do you shudder at the thought of velvet rubbed by short-nailed fingertips? Or were you ever burned by touching an ice-cold stove? Or, happier memory, can you still feel the touch of a well-loved absent hand? Be it remembered that few of these images are present in our minds except in combination. The sight and sound of the crashing avalanche are one. So are the flash and report of the huntman's gun that came so near doing for us. Thus imaging, especially conscious reproductive imagination, will become a valuable part of our mental processes in proportion as we direct and control it. 2. Productive Imagination All of the foregoing examples, and doubtless also many of the experiments you yourself may originate, are merely reproductive. Pleasurable or horrific as these may be, they are far less important than the images evoked by the productive imagination though that does not infer a separate faculty. Recall, again for experiment, some scene whose beginning you once saw enacted on a street corner, but passed by before the denouement was ready to be disclosed. Recall it all. That far the image is reproductive. But what followed? Let your fantasy roam at pleasure. The succeeding scenes are productive for you have more or less consciously invented the unreal on the basis of the real. And just here the fictionist, the poet, and the public speaker will see the value of productive imagery. True, the feet of the idol you build are on the ground, but its head pierces the clouds. It is a son of both earth and heaven. One fact it is important to note here. Imagery is a valuable mental asset in proportion as it is controlled by the higher intellectual power of pure reason. The untutored child of nature thinks largely in images, and therefore attaches to them undue importance. He readily confuses the real with the unreal, to him they are of like value. But the man of training readily distinguishes the one from the other, and evaluates each with some, if not with perfect, justice. So we see that unrestrained imaging may produce a rudderless steamer, while the trained faculty is the graceful sloop, skimming the seas at her skipper's will, her course steadied by the helm of reason, and her lightsome wings catching every air of heaven. The game of chess, the warlord's tactical plan, the evolution of a geometrical theorem, the devising of a great business campaign, the elimination of waste in a factory, the denouement of a powerful drama, the overcoming of an economic obstacle, the scheme for a sublime poem, and the convincing siege of an audience may, 
nay, indeed must, each be conceived in an image, and wrought to reality according to the plans and specifications laid upon the trestle-board by some modern imaginative Hiram. The farmer who would be content with the seed he possesses would have no harvest. Do not rest satisfied with the ability to recall images, but cultivate your creative imagination by building what might be upon the foundation of what is. 2. The Uses of Imaging in Public Speaking By this time you will have already made some general application of these ideas to the art of the platform, but to several specific uses we must now refer. 1. Imaging in Speech Preparation A. Set the image of your audience before you while you prepare. Disappointment may lurk here, and you cannot be forearmed for every emergency. But in the main you must meet your audience before you actually do. Image its probable mood and attitude toward the occasion, the theme, and the speaker. B. Conceive your speech as a whole while you are preparing its parts, else can you not see, image, how its parts shall be fitly framed together. C. Image the language you will use, so far as written or extemporaneous speech may dictate. The habit of imaging will give you choice of varied figures of speech, for remember that an address without fresh comparisons is like a garden without blooms. Do not be content with the first hackneyed figure that comes flowing to your pen-point, but dream on until the striking, the unusual, yet the vividly real comparison points your thought like steel does the arrow-tip. Note the freshness and effectiveness of the following description from the opening of O. Henry's story, The Harbinger. Long before the springtide is felt in the dull bosom of the yokel, does the city man know that the grass-green goddess is upon her throne. He sits at his breakfast eggs and toast, begirt by stone walls, opens his morning paper and sees journalism leave vernalism at the post. For whereas spring's couriers were once the evidence of our finer senses, now the associated press does the trick. The warble of the first robin in Hackensack, the stirring of the maple sap in Bennington, the budding of the pussy willows along the main street in Syracuse, the first chirp of the bluebird, the swan song of the blue point, the annual tornado in St. Louis, the plaint of the peach pessimist from Pompton, New Jersey, the regular visit of the tame wild goose with a broken leg to the pond near Bilgewater Junction, the base attempt of the drug trust to boost the price of quinine foiled in the house by Congressman Jinks, the first tall poplar struck by lightning, and the usual stunned picnickers who had taken refuge, the first crack of the ice jam in the Allegheny River, the finding of a violet in its mossy bed by the correspondent at round corners. These are the advanced signs of the burgeoning season that are wired into the wise city, while the farmer sees nothing but winter upon his dreary fields. But these be mere externals. The true harbinger is the heart. When Strephon seeks his Chloe and Mike his Maggie, then only as spring arrived, and the newspaper report of the five-foot rattler killed in Squire's Pettigrew's pasture confirmed. A hackneyed writer would probably have said that the newspaper told the city man about spring before the farmer could see any evidence of it, but that the real harbinger of spring was love, and that, in the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. 2. Imaging in Speech Delivery when once the passion of speech is on you, and you are warmed up, perhaps by striking till the iron is hot, so that you may not fail to strike when it is hot, your mood will be one of vision. Then, A, re-image past emotion, of which more elsewhere. The actor recalls the old feelings every time he renders his telling lines. B. Reconstruct in image the scenes you are to describe. C. 
image the objects in nature whose tone you are delineating so that bearing and voice and movement gesture will picture forth the whole convincingly instead of merely stating the fact that whiskey ruins homes the temperance speaker paints a drunkard coming home to abuse his wife and strike his children it is much more effective than telling the truth in abstract terms to depict the cruelness of war do not assert the fact abstractly war is cruel show the soldier an arm swept away by a bursting shell lying on the battlefield pleading for water show the children with tear-stained faces pressed against the window-pane praying for their dead father to return avoid general and prosaic terms paint pictures evolve images for the imagination of your audience to construct into pictures of their own three how to acquire the imaging habit you remember the american statesman who asserted that the way to resume is to resume the application is obvious beginning with the first simple analyses of this chapter test your own qualities of image making one by one practice the several kinds of images then add even invent others in combination for many images come to us in complex form like the combined noise and shoving and hot odor of a cheering crowd after practicing on reproductive imaging turn to the productive beginning with the reproductive and adding productive features for the sake of cultivating invention frequently allow your originating gifts full swing by weaving complete imaginary fabrics sights sounds scenes or the fine world of fantasy lies open to the journeyings of your winged steed in like manner train yourself in the use of figurative language learn first to distinguish and then to use its varied forms when used with restraint nothing can be more effective than the trope but once let extravagance creep in by the window and power will flee by the door all in all master your images let not them master you questions and exercises one give original examples of each kind of reproductive imagination two build two of these into imaginary incidents for platform use using your productive or creative imagination three define a fantasy b vision c fantastic d phantasmagoria e transmogrify f recollection four what is a figure of speech five define and give two examples of each of the following figures of speech footnote consult any good rhetoric an unabridged dictionary will also be of help at least one of the examples under each type would better be original a simile b metaphor c metonymy d synecdoche e apostrophe f vision g personification h hyperbole i irony six a what is an allegory b name one example c how could a short allegory be used as part of a public address seven write a short fable footnote for a full discussion of the form see the art of story writing by j berg s and wine and mary d chambers seven write a short fable for use in a speech follow either the ancient form aesop or the modern george aid josephine dodge dascom eight what do you understand by the historical present illustrate how it may be used only occasionally in a public address nine recall some disturbance on the street a describe it as you would on the platform b imagine what preceded the disturbance c imagine what followed it d 
connect the whole in a terse dramatic narration for the platform and deliver it with careful attention to all that you have learned of the public speaker's art ten do the same with other incidents you have seen or heard of or read of in the newspapers note it is hoped that this exercise will be varied and expanded until the student has gained considerable mastery of imaginative narration see chapter on narration 11. Experiments have proved that the majority of people think most vividly in terms of visual images. However, some think more readily in terms of auditory and motor images. It is a good plan to mix all kinds of images in the course of your address, for you will doubtless have all kinds of hearers. This plan will serve to give variety and strengthen your effects by appealing to the several senses of each hearer as well as interesting many different auditors for exercise a give several original examples of compound images and b construct brief descriptions of the scenes imagined for example the falling of a bridge in process of building twelve read the following observantly the strikers suffered bitter poverty last winter in new york last winter a woman visiting the east side of new york city saw another woman coming out of a tenement house wringing her hands upon inquiry the visitor found that a child had fainted in one of the apartments she entered and saw the child ill and in rags while the father a striker was too poor to provide medical help a physician was called and said the child had fainted from lack of food the only food in the house was dried fish. The visitor provided groceries for the family and ordered the milkman to leave milk for them daily. A month later she returned. The father of the family knelt down before her and, calling her an angel, said that she had saved their lives, for the milk she had provided was all the food they had had. In the two preceding paragraphs we have substantially the same story told twice. In the first paragraph we have a fact stated in general terms. In the second we have an outline picture of a specific happening. Now expand this outline into a dramatic recital, drawing freely upon your imagination. End of section 26. Recorded by Paul Adams www.yawnguy.com Section 27 of The Art of Public Speaking This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Paul Adams the Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Aisenwein. Chapter 27. Growing a Vocabulary. Quote, Boys flying kites haul in their white-winged birds. You can't do that way when you're flying words. Careful with fire is good advice we know. Careful with words is ten times doubly so. Thoughts unexpressed may sometimes fall back dead but God himself can't kill them when they're said." Unquote. Will Carton, The First Settler's Story The term vocabulary has a special as well as a general meaning. True, all vocabularies are grounded in the everyday words of the language, out of which grow the special vocabularies, but each such specialized group possesses a number of words of peculiar value for its own objects. These words may be used in other vocabularies also, but the fact that they are suited to a unique order of expression marks them as of special value to a particular craft or calling. In this respect the public speaker differs not at all from the poet, the novelist, the scientist, the traveller. He must add to his everyday stock words of value for the public presentation of thought. Quote, a study of the discourses of effective orators discloses the fact that they have a fondness for words signifying power, largeness, speed, action, color, light, and all their opposites. 
they frequently employ words expressive of the various emotions descriptive words adjectives used in fresh relations with nouns and apt epithets are freely employed indeed the nature of public speech permits the use of mildly exaggerated words which by the time they have reached the hearer's judgment will leave only a just impression Unquote. footnote how to attract and hold an audience j berg Asenvine. form the book note habit to possess a word involves three things to know its special and broader meanings to know its relation to other words and to be able to use it when you see or hear a familiar word used in an unfamiliar sense jot it down look it up and master it we have in mind a speaker of superior attainments who acquired his vocabulary by noting all new words he heard or read these he mastered and put into use soon his vocabulary became large varied and exact use a new word accurately five times and it is yours professor albert e hancock says quote, an author's vocabulary is of two kinds latent and dynamic latent those words he understands dynamic those he can readily use every intelligent man knows all the words he needs but he may not have them all ready for active service. The problem of literary diction consists in turning the latent into the dynamic." Unquote. Your dynamic vocabulary is the one you must especially cultivate. In his essay on A College Magazine, in the volume Memories and Portraits, Stevenson shows how he rose from imitation to originality in the use of words. He had particular reference to the formation of his literary style, but words are the raw materials of style, and his excellent example may well be followed judiciously by the public speaker. Words in their relations are vastly more important than words considered singly. Quote, Whenever I read a book or a passage that particularly pleased me, in which a thing was said or an effect rendered with propriety, in which there was either some conspicuous force or some happy distinction in the style, I must sit down at once and set myself to ape that quality. I was unsuccessful, and I knew it, and tried again, and was again unsuccessful, and always unsuccessful. But at least in these vain bouts I got some practice in rhythm, in harmony, in construction and coordination of parts. I have thus played the sedulous ape to Hazlitt, to Lamb, to Wordsworth, to Sir Thomas Brown, to Defoe, to Hawthorne, to Montaigne. That, like it or not, is the way to learn to write. Whether I have profited or not, that is the way. It was the way Keats learned, and there was never a finer temperament for literature than Keats. It is the great point of these imitations that there still shines beyond the student's reach his inimitable model. Let him try as he please, he is still sure of failure. And it is an old and very true saying that failure is the only high road to success." Unquote. Form the reference book habit. Do not be content with your general knowledge of a word. Press your study until you have mastered its individual shades of meaning and usage. Mere fluency is sure to become despicable, but accuracy never. The dictionary contains the crystallized usage of intellectual giants. No one who would write effectively dare despise its definitions and discriminations. Think, for example, of the different meanings of mantle, or model, or quantity. Any late edition of an unabridged dictionary is good, and is worth making sacrifices to own. Books of synonyms and antonyms, used cautiously, for there are few perfect synonyms in any language, will be found of great help. Consider the shades of meaning among such word groups as thief, peculator, defaulter, embezzler, burglar, yegman, robber, bandit, marauder, pirate, and many more. 
or the distinctions among Hebrew, Jew, Israelite, and Semite. Remember that no book of synonyms is trustworthy unless used with a dictionary. A thesaurus of the English language, by Dr. Francis A. March, is expensive, but full and authoritative. Of smaller books of synonyms and antonyms there are plenty. Footnote. A book of synonyms and antonyms is in preparation for this series, The Writer's Library. Study the connectives of English speech. Fernald's book on this title is a mine of gems. Unsuspected pitfalls lie in the loose use of and, or, for, while, and a score of tricky little connectives. Word derivations are rich in suggestiveness. Our English shows so much to foreign tongues, and has changed so much with the centuries, that whole addresses may grow out of a single root idea hidden away in an ancient word origin. Translation, also, is excellent exercise in word mastery, and consorts well with the study of derivations. Phrase books that show the origins of familiar expressions will surprise most of us by showing how carelessly everyday speech is used. Brewer's A Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, Edward's Word, Facts and Phrases, and Thornton's An American Glossary are all good, the last an expensive work in three volumes. A prefix or a suffix may essentially change the force of the stem, as in masterful and masterly, contemptible and contemptuous, envious and enviable. Thus, to study words in groups, according to their stems, prefixes and suffixes, is to gain a mastery over their shades of meaning, and introduce us to other related words. Do not favour one set or kind of words more than another. Quote, Sixty years and more ago, Lord Brougham, addressing the students of the University of Glasgow, laid down the rule that the native Anglo-Saxon part of our vocabulary was to be favoured at the expense of that other part, which has come from the Latin and Greek. The rule was an impossible one, and Lord Brougham himself never tried seriously to observe it. Nor, in truth, has any great writer made the attempt. Not only is their language highly composite, but the component words have, in De Quince's phrase, happily coalesced. It is easy to jest at words in osity and Asian as dictionary words and the like. But even Lord Brougham would have found it difficult to dispense with pomposity and imagination. Unquote. Footnote Composition and Rhetoric J. M. Hart the short, vigorous Anglo-Saxon will always be preferred for passages of special thrust and force, just as the Latin will continue to furnish us with flowing and smooth expressions. To mingle all sorts, however, will give variety, and that is most to be desired. Discuss words with those who know them. Since the language of the platform follows closely the diction of everyday speech, many useful words may be acquired in conversation with cultivated men, and when such discussion takes the form of disputation as to the meanings and usages of words, it will prove doubly valuable. The development of word power marches with the growth of individuality. Search faithfully for the right word. Books of reference are tripled in value when their owner has a passion for getting the kernels out of their shells. Ten minutes a day will do wonders for the nutcracker. Quote, I'm growing so peevish about my writing, says Flaubert. I'm like a man whose ear is true, but who plays falsely on the violin. His fingers refuse to reproduce precisely those sounds of which he has the inward sense. Then the tears come rolling down from the poor scraper's eyes, and the bow falls from his hand. Unquote. The same brilliant Frenchman sent this sound advice to his pupil, Guy de Maupassant. Quote, Whatever may be the thing which one wishes to say, there is but one word for expressing it, only one verb to animate it, 
only one adjective to qualify it. It is essential to search for this word, for this verb, for this adjective, until they are discovered, and to be satisfied with nothing else. Unquote. Walter Savage Lander once wrote, quote, I hate false words, and seek with care, difficulty, and moroseness those that fit the thing. Unquote. So did Sentimental Tommy, as related by James M. Barry in his novel bearing his hero's name as a title. No wonder T. Sanders became an author and a lion. Tommy, with another lad, is writing an essay on A Day in Church, in competition for a university scholarship. He gets on finely until he pauses for lack of a word. For nearly an hour he searches for this elusive thing, until suddenly he is told that the allotted time is up, and he is lost. Barry may tell the rest. Quote, essay! It was no more an essay than a twig is a tree, for the gowk had stuck in the middle of his second page. Yes, stuck is the right expression, as his chagrined teacher had to admit when the boy was cross-examined. He had not been up to some of his tricks, he had stuck, and his explanations, as you will admit, merely emphasized his incapacity. He had brought himself to public scorn for lack of a word. What word? they asked testily. But even now he could not tell. He had wanted a Scotch word that would signify how many people were in church, and it was on the tip of his tongue, but would come no farther. Puckle was nearly the word but it did not mean so many people as he meant. The hour had gone by just like winking. He had forgotten all about time while searching his mind for the word. The other five examiners were furious. "'You little tatty dooley!' Cathro roared. "'Were there not a dozen words to wile from if you had an ill will to puckle? "'What ailed you at Mansey? "'Or I thought of Mansey,' replied Tommy, woefully, for he was ashamed of himself. But, but a man's is a swarm. It would mean that the folk in the kirk were buzzing the gither like bees, instead of sitting still. Even if it does mean that, said Mr. Duthy with impatience, what was the need of being so particular? Surely the art of essay writing consists in using the first word that comes and hurrying on. That's how I did, said the proud McLaughlin, Tommy's second competitor. I see, interposed Mr. Gloag, that McLaughlin speaks of there being a mask of people in the church. Mask is a fine Scotch word. I thought of mask, whimpered Tommy, but that would mean the kirk was crammed, and I just meant it to be middling full. Flo would have done, suggested Mr. Lonimer. Flo's but a handful, said Tommy. Curran, then, you jackanapes! Curran's no enough. Mr. Lorimer flung up his hands in despair. "'I wanted something between Curran and Mask,' said Tommy doggedly, yet almost at the crying. Mr. Ogilvy, who had been hiding his admiration with difficulty, spread a net for him. "'You said you wanted a word that meant middling full. Well, why did you not say middling full, or fell mask?' "'Yes, why not?' demanded the ministers, unconsciously caught in the net. "'I wanted one word,' replied Tommy, unconsciously avoiding it. "'You jewel,' muttered Mr. Ogilvy under his breath, but Mr. Cathro would have banged the boy's head had not the ministers interfered. "'It is so easy, too, to find the right word,' said Mr. Gloag. "'It's no, it's difficult as to hit a squirrel,' cried Tommy and again Mr. Ogilvy nodded approval. And then an odd thing happened. As they were preparing to leave the school, Cathro having previously run Tommy out by the neck, the door opened a little, and there appeared in the aperture the face of Tommy, tear-stained but excited. "'I ken the word now!' he cried. "'It came to me out at once. It is Hantle!' Mr. Ogilvy said in an ecstasy to himself, he had to think of it till he got it, and he got it. The laddie is a genius. Unquote. Questions and exercises. 1. 
What is the derivation of the word vocabulary? 2. Briefly discuss any complete speech given in this volume with reference to a. Exactness, b. Variety, and c. Charm in the use of words. 3. Give original examples of the kinds of word studies referred to on pages 337 and 338. 4. Deliver a short talk on any subject, using at least five words which have not been previously in your dynamic vocabulary. 5. Make a list of the unfamiliar words found in any address you may select. 6. Deliver a short extemporaneous speech, giving your opinions on the merits and demerits of the use of unusual words in public speaking. 7. Try to find an example of the overuse of unusual words in a speech. 8. Have you used reference books in word studies? If so, state with what result. 9. Find as many synonyms and antonyms as possible for each of the following words. Excess, rare, severe, beautiful, clear, happy, difference, care, skillful, involve, enmity, profit, absurd, evident, faint, friendly, harmony, hatred, honest, inherent. End of section 27. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 28 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Essenwein. Chapter 28 Memory Training. Quote, Lulled in the countless chambers of the brain, our thoughts are linked by many a hidden chain. Awake but one, and lo, what myriads rise! Each stamps its image as the other flies. Hail, memory, hail! In thy exhaustless mine, from age to age unnumbered treasures shine. Thought and her shadowy brood thy call obey, and place and time a subject to thy sway. Unquote. Samuel Rogers, Pleasures of Memory Many an orator, like Thackeray, has made the best part of his speech to himself on the way home from the lecture hall. Presence of mind, it remained for Mark Twain to observe, is greatly promoted by absence of body. A hole in the memory is no less a common complaint than a distressing one. Henry Ward Beecher was able to deliver one of the world's greatest addresses at Liverpool because of his excellent memory. In speaking of the occasion, Mr. Beecher said that all the events, arguments, and appeals that he had ever heard or read or written seemed to pass before his mind as oratorical weapons, and standing there he had but to reach forth his hand and, quote, seize the weapons as they went smoking by, unquote. Ben Jonson could repeat all he had written. Scaliger memorized the Iliad in three weeks. Locke says, quote, Without memory, man is a perpetual infant. Unquote. Quintilian and Aristotle regarded it as a measure of genius. Now, all this is very good. We all agree that a reliable memory is an invaluable possession for the speaker. We never dissent for a moment when we are solemnly told that his memory should be a storehouse from which at pleasure he can draw facts, fancies, and illustrations. But can the memory be trained to act as the warder for all the truths that we have gained from thinking, reading, and experience? And if so, how? Let us see. Twenty years ago, a poor immigrant boy employed as a dishwasher in New York, wandered into the Cooper Union and began to read a copy of Henry George's Progress and Poverty. His passion for knowledge was awakened, 
and he became a habitual reader. But he found that he was not able to remember what he read, so he began to train his naturally poor memory until he became the world's greatest memory expert. This man was the late Mr. Felix Beryl. Mr. Beryl could tell the population of any town in the world of more than five thousand inhabitants. He could recall the names of forty strangers who had just been introduced to him, and was able to tell which had been presented third, eighth, seventeenth, or in any order. He knew the date of every important event in history, and could not only recall an endless array of facts, but could correlate them perfectly. To what extent Mr. Beryl's remarkable memory was natural, and required only attention for its development, seems impossible to determine with exactness, but the evidence clearly indicates that, however useless were many of his memory feats, a highly retentive memory was developed, where before only a good forgettery existed. The freak memory is not worth striving for, but a good working memory decidedly is. Your power as a speaker will depend to a large extent upon your ability to retain impressions and call them forth when occasion demands, and that sort of memory is like muscle, it responds to training. Heading. What not to do. It is sheer misdirected effort to begin to memorize by learning words by rote, for that is beginning to build a pyramid at the apex. For years our schools were cursed by this vicious system. Vicious not only because it is inefficient, but for the more important reason that it hurts the mind. True, some minds are natively endowed with a wonderful facility in remembering strings of words, facts, and figures. But such are rarely good reasoning minds. The normal person must belabor and force the memory to acquire in this artificial way. Again, it is hurtful to force the memory in hours of physical weakness or mental weariness. Health is the basis of the best mental action, and the operation of memory is no exception. Finally, do not become a slave to a system. Knowledge of a few simple facts of mind and memory will set you to work at the right end of the operation. Use these principles, whether included in a system or not, but do not bind yourself to a method that tends to lay more stress on the way to remember than on the development of memory itself. It is nothing short of ridiculous to memorize ten words in order to remember one fact. Heading The Natural Laws of Memory Concentrated attention at the time when you wish to store the mind is the first step in memorizing and the most important one by far. You forgot the fourth of the list of articles your wife asked you to bring home, chiefly because you allowed your attention to waver for an instant when she was telling you. Attention may not be concentrated attention. When a siphon is charged with gas, it is sufficiently filled with the carbonic acid vapour to make its influence felt. A mind charged with an idea is charged to a degree sufficient to hold it. Too much charging will make the siphon burst. Too much attention to trifles leads to insanity. Adequate attention, then, is the fundamental secret of remembering. Generally, we do not give a fact adequate attention when it does not seem important. Almost everyone has seen how the seeds in an apple point and has memorized the date of Washington's death. Most of us have, perhaps wisely, forgotten both. The little nick in the bark of a tree is healed over and obliterated in a season, but the gashes in the trees around Gettysburg are still apparent after fifty years. Impressions that are gathered lightly are soon obliterated. Only deep impressions can be recalled at will. Henry Ward Beecher said, quote, One intense hour will do more than dreamy years. Unquote. To memorize ideas and words, concentrate on them until they are fixed firmly and deeply in your mind, and accord to them their true importance. Listen with the mind, and you will remember. How shall you concentrate? How would you increase the fighting effectiveness of a man of war? One vital way would be to increase the size and number of its guns. 
To strengthen your memory, increase both the number and the force of your mental impressions by attending to them intensely. Loose skimming reading and drifting habits of reading destroy memory power. However, as most books and newspapers do not warrant any other kind of attention, it will not do altogether to condemn this method of reading, but avoid it when you are trying to memorize. Environment has a strong influence upon concentration, until you have learned to be alone in a crowd and undisturbed by clamor. When you set out to memorize a fact or a speech, you may find the task easier away from all sounds and moving objects. All impressions foreign to the one you desire to fix in your mind must be eliminated. The next great step in memorizing is to pick out the essentials of the subject, arrange them in order, and dwell upon them intently. Think clearly of each essential one after the other. Thinking a thing, not allowing the mind to wander to non-essentials, is really memorizing. Association of ideas is universally recognized as an essential in memory work. Indeed, whole systems of memory training have been founded on this principle. Many speakers memorize only the outlines of their addresses, filling in the words at the moment of speaking. Some have found it helpful to remember an outline by associating the different points with objects in the room. Speaking on peace, you may wish to dwell on the cost, the cruelty, and the failure of war, and so lead to the justice of arbitration. Before going on the platform, if you will associate four divisions of your outline with four objects in the room, this association may help you to recall them. You may be prone to forget your third point, but you remember that once when you were speaking, the electric lights failed, so arbitrarily the electric light globe will help you to remember failure. Such associations, being unique, tend to stick in the mind. While recently speaking on the six kinds of imagination, the present writer formed them into an acrostic. Visual, auditory, motor, gustatory, olfactory, and tactile furnished the nonsense word vamgut, but the six points were easily remembered. In the same way that children are taught to remember the spelling of teasing words, separate comes from separ, and as an automobile driver remembers that two C's and then two H's lead him into Castor Road, Cotman Street, Haynes Street, and Henry Street, so important points in your address may be fixed in mind by arbitrary symbols invented by yourself. The very work of devising the scheme is a memory action. The psychological process is simple. It is one of noting intently the steps by which a fact, or a truth, or even a word has come to you. Take advantage of this tendency of the mind to remember by association. Repetition is a powerful aid to memory. Thurlow Weed, the journalist and political leader, was troubled because he so easily forgot the names of persons he met from day to day. He corrected the weakness, relates Professor William James, by forming the habit of attending carefully to names he had heard during the day and then repeating them to his wife every evening. Doubtless Mrs. Weed was heroically long-suffering, but the device worked admirably. After reading a passage you would remember, close the book, reflect, and repeat the contents, aloud if possible. Reading thoughtfully aloud has been found by many to be a helpful memory practice. Write what you wish to remember. This is simply one more way of increasing the number and strength of your mental impressions by utilizing all your avenues of impression. It will help to fix a speech in your mind if you speak it aloud, listen to it, write it out, and look at it intently. You have then impressed it on your mind by means of vocal, auditory, muscular, and visual impressions. Some folk have peculiarly distinct auditory memories. They are able to recall things heard much better than things seen. Others have the visual memory. They are best able to recall sight impressions.
As you recall a walk you have taken, are you able to remember better the sights or the sounds? Find out what kinds of impressions your memory retains best, and use them the most. To fix an idea in mind, use every possible kind of impression. Daily habit is a great memory cultivator. Learn a lesson from the marathon runner. Regular exercise, though never so little daily, will strengthen your memory in a surprising manner. Try to describe in detail the dress, looks, and manner of the people you pass on the street. Observe the room you are in. Close your eyes and describe its contents. View closely the landscape and write out a detailed description of it. How much did you miss? Notice the contents of the show windows on the street. How many features are you able to recall? Continual practice in this feat may develop in you as remarkable proficiency as it did in Robert Houdin and his son. The daily memorizing of a beautiful passage in literature will not only lend strength to the memory, but will store the mind with gems for quotations. But whether by little or much, add daily to your memory power by practice. Memorize out of doors, the buoyancy of the wood, the shore, or the stormy night on deserted streets may freshen your mind as it does the minds of countless others. Lastly, cast out fear. Tell yourself that you can, and will, and do remember. By pure exercise of selfism, assert your mastery. Be obsessed with the fear of forgetting, and you cannot remember. Practice the reverse. Throw aside your manuscript crutches. You may tumble once or twice, but what matters that, for you are going to learn to walk and leap and run. Heading. Memorizing a speech. Now let us try to put into practice the foregoing suggestions. First, reread this chapter, noting the nine ways by which memorizing may be helped. Then read over the following selection from Beecher, applying so many of the suggestions as are practicable. Get the spirit of the selection firmly in your mind. Make mental note of, write down if you must, the succession of ideas. Now memorize the thought. Then memorize the outline, the order in which the different ideas are expressed. Finally, memorize the exact wording. No, when you have done all this with the most faithful attention to directions, you will not find memorizing easy, unless you have previously trained your memory, or it is naturally retentive. Only by constant practice will memory become strong and only by continually observing these same principles will it remain strong. You will, however, have made a beginning, and that is no mean matter. Quote, Heading, The Reign of the Common People I do not suppose that if you were to go and look upon the experiment of self-government in America, you would have a very high opinion of it. I have not either, if I just look upon the surface of things. Why, men will say, it stands to reason that sixty million ignorant of law, ignorant of constitutional history, ignorant of jurisprudence, of finance and taxes and tariffs and forms of currency, sixty million people that never studied these things are not fit to rule. Your diplomacy is as complicated as ours, and is the most complicated on earth, for all things grow in complexity as they develop toward a higher condition. What fitness is there in these people? Well, it is not democracy merely. It is a representative democracy. Our people do not vote in mass for anything. They pick out captains of thought. They pick out the men that do know, and they send them to the legislature to think for them, and then the people afterwards ratify or disallow them. But when you come to the legislature, I am bound to confess that the thing does not look very much more cheering on the outside. Do they really select the best men? Yes, in times of danger they do very generally, but in ordinary time kissing goes by favour. You know what the duty of a regular Republican Democratic legislator is? It is to go back again next winter. His second duty is what? His second duty is to put himself under that extraordinary providence that takes care of legislators' salaries. 
The old miracle of the prophet and the meal and the oil is outdone immeasurably in our days. For they go there poor one year, and go home rich. In four years they become money-lenders. All my trust in that gracious providence that takes care of legislators' salaries. Their next duty after that is to serve the party that sent them up, and then, if there is anything left of them, it belongs to the commonwealth. Someone has said very wisely that if a man travelling wishes to relish his dinner, he had better not go into the kitchen to see where it is cooked. If a man wishes to respect and obey the law, he had better not go to the legislature to see where that is cooked. Unquote. Henry Ward Beecher, from a lecture delivered in Exeter Hall, London, 1886, when making his last tour of Great Britain. Heading in case of trouble. But what are you to do if, notwithstanding all your efforts, you should forget your points, and your mind for the minute becomes blank? This is a deplorable condition that sometimes arises and must be dealt with. Obviously, you can sit down and admit defeat. Such a consummation is devoutly to be shunned. Walking slowly across the platform may give you time to grip yourself compose your thoughts and stave off disaster perhaps the surest and most practical method is to begin a new sentence with your last important word this is not advocated as a method of composing a speech it is merely an extreme measure which may save you in tight circumstances it is like the fire department the less you must use it the better if this method is followed very long, you are likely to find yourself talking about plum pudding or Chinese Gordon in the most unexpected manner, so of course you will get back to your lines the earliest moment that your feet have hit the platform. Let us see how this plan works. Obviously your extemporized words will lack somewhat of polish, but in such a pass crudity is better than failure. Now you have come to a dead wall after saying, quote, Joan of Arc fought for liberty. Unquote. By this method you might get something like this. Quote, liberty is a sacred privilege for which mankind always had to fight. These struggles, platitude, but push on, fill the pages of history. History records the gradual triumph of the serf over the lord, the slave over the master. The master has continually tried to usurp unlimited powers. Power during the medieval ages accrued to the owner of the land with a spear and a strong castle. But the strong castle and spear were of little avail after the discovery of gunpowder. Gunpowder was the greatest boon that liberty had ever known. Unquote. Thus far you have linked one idea with another rather obviously. But you are getting your second wind now, and may venture to relax your grip on the too evident chain. And so you say, quote, With gunpowder, the humblest serf in all the land could put an end to the life of the tyrannical baron behind the castle walls. The struggle for liberty, with gunpowder as its aid, wrecked empires, and built up a new era for all mankind. Unquote. In a moment more you have gotten back to your outline and the day is saved. Practicing exercises like the above will not only fortify you against the death of your speech when your memory misses fire, but will also provide an excellent training for fluency in speaking. Stock up with ideas. Heading. Questions and Exercises. 1. Pick out and state briefly the nine helps to memorizing suggested in this chapter. 2. Report on whatever success you may have had with any of the plans for memory culture suggested in this chapter. Have any been less successful than others? 3. Freely criticize any of the suggested methods. 4. Give an original example of memory by association of ideas. 5. List in order the chief ideas of any speech in this volume. 6. Repeat them from memory. 7. Expand them into a speech using your own words. 8. Illustrate practically what you would do if in the middle of a speech on progress your memory failed you and you stopped suddenly on the following sentence. Quote, 
the last century saw marvellous progress in varied lines of activity. Unquote. 9. How many quotations that fit well in the speaker's tall chest can you recall from memory? 10. Memorize the poem on page 42. How much time does it require? End of section 28. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 29 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Chapter 29. Right Thinking and Personality. Quote, whatever crushes individuality is despotism by whatever name it may be called Unquote. john stuart mill on liberty Quote, right thinking fits for complete living by developing the power to appreciate the beautiful in nature and art power to think the true and to will the good power to live the life of thought and faith and hope and love Unquote. N. C. Schaeffer, Thinking and Learning to Think. The speaker's most valuable possession is personality, that indefinable, imponderable something which sums up what we are and makes us different from others, that distinctive force of self which operates appreciably on those whose lives we touch. It is personality alone that makes us long for higher things. Rob us of our sense of individual life with its gains and losses, its duties and joys, and we grovel. Quote, Few human creatures, said John Stuart Mill, will consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though he should be persuaded that the fool, or the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they with theirs. It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be a Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied and if the fool or the pig is of a different opinion it is only because they know only their own side of the question the other party to the comparison knows both sides Unquote. now it is precisely because the socrates type of person lives on the plan of right thinking and restrained feeling and willing that he prefers his state to that of the animal all that a man is all his happiness, his sorrow, his achievements, his failures, his magnetism, his weakness, all are in an amazingly large measure the direct results of his thinking. Thought and heart combine to produce right thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he does not think in his heart, so he can never become. Since this is true, personality can be developed, and its latent powers brought out by careful cultivation. We have long since ceased to believe that we are living in a realm of chance. So clear and exact are nature's laws that we forecast, scores of years in advance, the appearance of a certain comet, and foretell to the minute an eclipse of the sun. And we understand this law of cause and effect in all our material realms. We do not plant potatoes and expect to pluck hyacinths. The law is universal. It applies to our mental powers, to morality, to personality, quite as much as to the heavenly bodies and the grain of the fields. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, and nothing else. Character has always been regarded as one of the chief factors of the speaker's power. Cato defined the orator as, We're bonus decendi peritus, a good man skilled in speaking. Phillips Brooks says, quote, Nobody can truly stand as an utterer before the world, unless he be profoundly living and earnestly thinking. Unquote. Quote, 
Character, says Emerson, is a natural power, like light and heat, and all nature cooperates with it. The reason why we feel one man's presence and do not feel another's is as simple as gravity. Truth is the summit of being. Justice is the application of it to affairs. All individual natures stand in a scale, according to the purity of this element in them. The will of the pure runs down into other natures, as water runs down from the higher into a lower vessel. This natural force is no more to be withstood than any other natural force. Character is nature in the highest form. Unquote. It is absolutely impossible for impure, bestial, and selfish thoughts to blossom into loving and altruistic habits. Thistle seeds bring forth only the thistle. Contrariwise, it is entirely impossible for continual altruistic, sympathetic, and serviceful thoughts to bring forth a low and vicious character. Either thoughts or feelings proceed and determine all our actions. Actions develop into habits, habits constitute character, and character determines destiny. Therefore, to guard our thoughts and control our feelings is to shape our destinies. The syllogism is complete, and old as it is, it is still true. Since character is nature in the highest form, the development of character must proceed on natural lines. The garden left to itself will bring forth weeds and scrawny plants, but the flower beds nurtured carefully will blossom into fragrance and beauty. As the student entering college largely determines his vocation by choosing from the different courses of the curriculum, so do we choose our characters by choosing our thoughts. We are steadily going up toward that which we most wish for, or steadily sinking to the level of our low desires. What we secretly cherish in our hearts is a symbol of what we shall receive. Our trains of thoughts are hurrying us on to our destiny. When you see the flag fluttering to the south, you know the wind is coming from the north. When you see the straws and papers being carried to the northward, you realize the wind is blowing out of the south. It is just as easy to ascertain a man's thoughts by observing the tendency of his character. Let it not be suspected for one moment that all this is merely a preachment on the question of morals. It is that, but much more, for it touches the whole man, his imaginative nature, his ability to control his feelings, the mastery of his thinking faculties, and, perhaps most largely, his power to will and to carry his volitions into effective action. Right thinking constantly assumes that the will sits enthroned to execute the dictates of mind, conscience, and heart. Never tolerate for an instant the suggestion that your will is not absolutely efficient. The way to will is to will, and the very first time you are tempted to break a worthy resolution, and you will be, you may be certain of that, make your fight then and there. You cannot afford to lose that fight. You must win it. Don't swerve for an instant, but keep that resolution if it kills you. It will not, but you must fight, just as though life depended on the victory, and indeed your personality may actually lie in the balances. Your success or failure as a speaker will be determined very largely by your thoughts and your mental attitude. The present writer had a student of limited education enter one of his classes in public speaking. He proved to be a very poor speaker, and the instructor could conscientiously do little but point out faults. However, the young man was warned not to be discouraged. With sorrow in his voice, and the essence of earnestness beaming from his eyes, he replied, I will not be discouraged. I want so badly to know how to speak. It was warm, human, and from the very heart. And he did keep on trying, and developed into a creditable speaker. There is no power under the stars that can defeat a man with that attitude. He who down in the deeps of his heart earnestly longs to get facility in speaking and is willing to make the sacrifices necessary will reach his goal. Ask and ye shall receive. 
seek and ye shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you is indeed applicable to those who would acquire speech power you will not realize the prize that you wish for languidly but the goal that you start out to attain with the spirit of the old guard that dies but never surrenders you will surely reach your belief in your ability and your willingness to make sacrifices for that belief are the double index to your future achievements lincoln had a dream of his possibilities as a speaker he transmuted that dream into life solely because he walked many miles to borrow books which he read by the log fire glow at night he sacrificed much to realize his vision livingstone had a great faith in his ability to serve the benighted races of africa to actualize that faith he gave up all leaving england for the interior of the dark continent he struck the death blow to europe's profits from the slave trade joan of arc had great self-confidence glorified by an infinite capacity for sacrifice she drove the english beyond the loire and stood beside charles while he was crowned these all realized their strongest desires the law is universal desire greatly and you shall achieve sacrifice much and you shall obtain stanton davis kirkham has beautifully expressed this thought Quote, you may be keeping accounts, and presently you shall walk out of the door that has for so long seemed to you the barrier of your ideals, and shall find yourself before an audience, the pen still behind your ear, the ink stains on your fingers, and then and there shall pour out the torrent of your inspiration. You may be driving sheep, and you shall wander to the city, bucolic and open-mouthed, shall wander under the intrepid guidance of the spirit into the studio of the master and after a time he shall say i have nothing more to teach you and now you have become the master who did so recently dream of great things while driving sheep you shall lay down the saw and the plane to take upon yourself the regeneration of the world Unquote. questions and exercises one what in your own words is personality two how does personality in a speaker affect you as a listener three in what ways does personality show itself in a speaker four deliver a short speech on the power of will in the public speaker five deliver a short address based on any sentence you choose from this chapter End of section twenty nine. Recording by Paul Adams. www.yawnguy.com Section thirty of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwine. Chapter 30. After Dinner and Other Occasional Speaking. Quote, the perception of the ludicrous is a pledge of sanity. Unquote. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Essays. Quote, and let him be sure to leave other men their turns to speak. Unquote. Francis Bacon, Essay on Civil and Moral Discourse. Perhaps the most brilliant, and certainly the most entertaining of all speeches, are those delivered on after dinner and other special occasions. The air of well-fed content in the former, and of expectancy well-primed in the latter, furnishes an audience which, though not readily won, is prepared for the best while the speaker himself is pretty sure to have been chosen for his gifts of oratory the first essential of good occasional speaking is to study the occasion precisely what is the object of the meeting how important is the occasion to the audience how large will the audience be what sort of people are they how large is the auditorium who selects the speaker's themes who else is to speak what are they to speak about Precisely how long am I to speak? Who speaks before I do, and who follows? If you want to hit the nail on the head, ask such questions as these. 
Footnote. See also page 205. No occasional address can succeed unless it fits the occasion to a T. Many prominent men have lost prestige because they were too careless, or too busy, or too self-confident to respect the occasion and the audience by learning the exact conditions under which they were to speak. Leaving too much to the moment is taking a long chance, and generally means a less effective speech, if not a failure. Suitability is the big thing in an occasional speech. When Mark Twain addressed the Army of the Tennessee in Reunion at Chicago in 1877, he responded to the toast, The Babies. Two things in the after-dinner speech are remarkable. The bright introduction, by which he subtly claimed the interest of all, and the humorous use of military terms throughout. Quote, Mr. Chairman and Gentlemen, The Babies. Now that's something like. We haven't all had the good fortune to be ladies. We have not all been generals or poets or statesmen. But when the toast works down to the babies, we stand on common ground, for we've all been babies. It is a shame that for a thousand years the world's banquets have utterly ignored the baby, as if he didn't amount to anything. If you, gentlemen, will stop and think a minute, if you will go back fifty or a hundred years to your early married life and recontemplate your first baby, you will remember that he amounted to a good deal, and even something over. Unquote. Quote, As a vessel is known by the sound, whether it be cracked or not, said Demosthenes, so men are proved by their speeches, whether they be wise or foolish. Unquote. Surely the occasional address furnishes a severe test of a speaker's wisdom. To be trivial on a serious occasion, to be funereal at a banquet, to be long-winded ever, these are the marks of non-sense. Some imprudent souls seem to select the most friendly of after-dinner occasions for the explosion of a bombshell of dispute. Around the dinner-table it is the custom of even political enemies to bury their hatchets anywhere rather than in some convenient skull. It is the height of bad taste to raise questions that in hours consecrated to good will can only irritate. Occasional speeches offer good chances for humour, particularly the funny story, for humour with a genuine point is not trivial. But do not spin a whole skein of humorous yarns with no more connection than the inane and threadbare, and that reminds me. An anecdote without bearing may be funny, but one less funny that fits theme and occasion is far preferable. There is no way, short of sheer power of speech, that so surely leads to the heart of an audience as rich, appropriate humor. The scattered diners in a great banqueting hall, the after-dinner lethargy, the anxiety over approaching last train time, the overfull list of overfull speakers, all throw out a challenge to the speaker to do his best to win an interested hearing. And when success does come, it is usually due to a happy mixture of seriousness and humour for humour alone rarely scores so heavily as the two combined, while the utterly grave speech never does on such occasions. If there is one place more than another where second-hand opinions and platitudes are unwelcome, it is in the after-dinner speech. Whether you are toastmaster or the last speaker to try to hold the waning crowd at midnight, be as original as you can. How is it possible to summarize the qualities that go to make up the good after-dinner speech when we remember the inimitable serious drollery of Mark Twain, the sweet southern eloquence of Henry W. Grady, the funereal gravity of the humorous Charles Battelle Loomis, the charm of Henry Van Dyke, the geniality of F. Hopkinson Smith, and the all-round delightfulness of Chauncey M. Depew? America is literally rich in such gladsome speakers who punctuate real sense with nonsense and so make both effective. Commemorative occasions, 
unveilings, commencements, dedications, eulogies, and all the train of special public gatherings offer rare opportunities for the display of tact and good sense in handling occasion, theme, and audience. When to be dignified and when colloquial, when to soar and when to ramble arm in arm with your hearers, when to flame and when to soothe, when to instruct and when to amuse, in a word, the whole matter of appropriateness must constantly be in mind lest you write your speech on water. Finally, remember the beatitude, blessed is the man that maketh short speeches, for he shall be invited to speak again. Heading Selections for Study Title Last Days of the Confederacy Extract Quote, The Rapidan suggests another scene to which allusion has often been made since the war, but which, as illustrative also of the spirit of both armies, I may be permitted to recall in this connection. In the mellow twilight of an April day, the two armies were holding their dress parades on the opposite hills bordering the river. At the close of the parade, a magnificent brass band of the Union Army played with great spirit the patriotic airs Hail Columbia and Yankee Doodle, whereupon the Federal troops responded with a patriotic shout. The same band then played the soul-stirring strains of Dixie, to which a mighty response came from ten thousand southern troops. A few moments later, when the stars had come out as witnesses, and when all nature was in harmony, there came from the same band the old melody, Home Sweet Home. As its familiar and pathetic notes rolled over the water and thrilled through the spirits of the soldiers, the hills reverberated with a thundering response from the united voices of both armies. What was there in this old, old music to so touch the chords of sympathy, so thrill the spirits and cause the frames of brave men to tremble with emotion? It was the thought of home. To thousands, doubtless, it was the thought of that eternal home to which the next battle might be the gateway. To thousands of others, it was the thought of their dear earthly homes, where loved ones at that twilight hour were bowing round the family altar and asking God's care over the absent soldier boy. Unquote. General J. B. Gordon, C.S.A. Title. Welcome to Kasuth. Extract. Quote, Let me ask you to imagine that the contest in which the United States asserted their independence of Great Britain had been unsuccessful, that our armies, through treason or a league of tyrants against us, had been broken and scattered, that the great men who led them and who swayed our councils, our Washington, our Franklin, and the venerable President of the American Congress, had been driven forth as exiles. If there had existed at that day, in any part of the civilized world, a powerful republic with institutions resting on the same foundations of liberty which our own countrymen sought to establish, would there have been in that republic any hospitality too cordial, any sympathy too deep, any zeal for their glorious but unfortunate cause too fervent or too active to be shown toward these illustrious fugitives? Gentlemen, the case I have supposed is before you. The Washingtons, the Franklins, the Hancocks of Hungary, driven out by a far worse tyranny than was ever endured here, are wanderers in foreign lands. Some of them have sought a refuge in our country. One sits with this company our guest to-night, and we must measure the duty we owe them by the same standard which we would have had history apply if our ancestors had met with a fate like theirs. Unquote. William Cullen Bryant Title The Influence of Universities Extract Quote when the excitement of party warfare presses dangerously near our national safeguards, I would have the intelligent conservatism of our universities and colleges warn the contestants in impressive tones against the perils of a breach impossible to repair. 
when popular discontent and passion are stimulated by the arts of designing partisans to a pitch perilously near to class hatred or sectional anger i would have our universities and colleges sound the alarm in the name of american brotherhood and fraternal dependence when the attempt is made to delude the people into the belief that their suffrages can change the operation of national laws i would have our universities and colleges proclaim that those laws are inexorable and far removed from political control when selfish interest seeks undue private benefits through governmental aid and public places are claimed as rewards of party service i would have our universities and colleges persuade the people to a relinquishment of the demand for party spoils and exhort them to a disinterested and patriotic love of their government whose unperverted operation secures to every citizen his just share of the safety and prosperity it holds in store for all i would have the influence of these institutions on the side of religion and morality i would have those they send out among the people not ashamed to acknowledge god and to proclaim his interposition in the affairs of men enjoining such obedience to his laws as makes manifest the path of national perpetuity and prosperity Unquote. Grover Cleveland, delivered at the Princeton Sesquicentennial, 1896. Title, Eulogy of Garfield. Extract. Quote, great in life, he was surpassingly great in death. For no cause, in the very frenzy of wantonness and wickedness, by the red hand of murder, he was thrust from the full tide of this world's interest, from its hopes, its aspirations, its victories, into the visible presence of death, and he did not quail not alone for the one short moment in which stunned and dazed he could give up life hardly aware of its relinquishment but through days of deadly languor through weeks of agony that was not less agony because silently born with clear sight and calm courage he looked into his open grave what blight and ruin met his anguished eyes whose lips may tell what brilliant broken plans what baffled high ambitions what sundering of strong warm manhood's friendships what bitter rending of sweet household ties behind him a proud expectant nation a great host of sustaining friends a cherished and happy mother wearing the full rich honours of her early toil and tears the wife of his youth whose whole life lay in his the little boys not yet emerged from childhood's day of frolic the fair young daughter the sturdy sons just springing into closest companionship claiming every day and every day rewarding a father's love and care and in his heart the eager rejoicing power to meet all demand before him desolation and great darkness and his soul was not shaken his countrymen were thrilled with instant profound and universal sympathy masterful in his mortal weakness he became the centre of a nation's love enshrined in the prayers of a world but all the love and all the sympathy could not share with him his suffering he trod the wine-press alone with unfaltering front he faced death with unfailing tenderness he took leave of life Above the demoniac hiss of the assassin's bullet, he heard the voice of God. With simple resignation, he bowed to the divine decree. James G. Blaine delivered at the memorial service held by the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Title, Eulogy of Lee, Extract At the bottom of all true heroism is unselfishness its crowning expression is sacrifice the world is suspicious of vaunted heroes but when the true hero has come and we know that here he is in verity ah how the hearts of men leap forth to greet him how worshipfully we welcome god's noblest work the strong honest fearless upright man 
in robert lee was such a hero vouchsafed to us and to mankind and whether we behold him declining command of the federal army to fight the battles and share the miseries of his own people proclaiming on the heights in front of gettysburg that the fault of the disaster was his own leading charges in the crisis of combat walking under the yoke of conquest without a murmur of complaint or refusing fortune to come here and train the youth of his country in the paths of duty he is ever the same meek grand self-sacrificing spirit here he exhibited qualities not less worthy and heroic than those displayed on the broad and open theatre of conflict when the eyes of nations watch his every action here in the calm repose of civil and domestic duties and in the trying routine of incessant tasks he lived a life as high as when day by day he marshalled and led his thin and wasting lines and slept by night upon the field that was to be drenched again in blood upon the morrow and now he has vanished from us for ever and is this all that is left of him this handful of dust beneath the marble stone no the ages answer as they rise from the gulfs of time where lie the wrecks of kingdoms and estates holding up in their hands as their only trophies the names of those who have wrought for man in the love and fear of god and in love unfearing for their fellow men no the present answers bending by his tomb no the future answers as the breath of the morning fans its radiant brow and its soul drinks in sweet inspirations from the lovely life of lee no methinks the very heavens echo as melt into their depths the words of reverent love that voice the hearts of men to the tingling stars come we then to-day in loyal love to sanctify our memories to purify our hopes to make strong all good intent by communion with the spirit of him who being dead yet speaketh come child in thy spotless innocence come woman in thy purity come youth in thy prime come manhood in thy strength come age in thy ripe wisdom come citizen come soldier let us strew the roses and lilies of june around his tomb for he like them exhaled in his life nature's beneficence and the grave has consecrated that life and given it to us all let us crown his tomb with the oak the emblem of his strength and with the laurel the emblem of his glory and let these guns whose voices he knew of old awake the echoes of the mountains that nature herself may join in his solemn requiem come for here he rests and on this green bank by this fair stream we set to-day a votive stone that memory may his deeds redeem when like our sires our sons are gone Unquote. john warwick daniel on the unveiling of Lee's statue at Washington and Lee University, Lexington, Virginia, 1883. Questions and Exercises 1. Why should humour find a place in after-dinner speaking? 2. Briefly give your impressions of any notable after-dinner address that you have heard. 3. Briefly outline an imaginary occasion of any sort and give three subjects appropriate for addresses. 4. Deliver one such address, not to exceed ten minutes in length. 5. What proportion of emotional ideas do you find in the extracts given in this chapter? 6. Humour was used in some of the foregoing addresses. In which others would it have been inappropriate? 7. Prepare and deliver an after-dinner speech suited to one of the following occasions, and be sure to use humour. A lodge banquet, a political party dinner, a church men's club dinner, a civic association banquet, a banquet in honour of a celebrity, a woman's club annual dinner, a business men's association dinner, a manufacturer's club dinner, an alumni banquet an old home-week barbecue. End of section 30
Recording by Paul Adams. www.yawnguy.com Section 31 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Chapter 31. Making Conversation Effective. Quote, in conversation, avoid the extremes of forwardness and reserve. Unquote. Cato. Quote, conversation is the laboratory and workshop of the student. Unquote. Emerson, Essays, Circles. The father of W. E. Gladstone considered conversation to be both an art and an accomplishment. Around the dinner table in his home, some topic of local or national interest, or some debated question, was constantly being discussed. In this way a friendly rivalry for supremacy in conversation arose among the family, and an incident observed in the street, an idea gleaned from a book, a deduction from personal experience, was carefully stored as material for the family exchange. Thus his early years of practice in elegant conversation prepared the younger Gladstone for his career as a leader and speaker. There is a sense in which the ability to converse effectively is efficient public speaking, for our conversation is often heard by many, and occasionally decisions of great moment hinge upon the tone and quality of what we say in private. Indeed, conversation in the aggregate probably wields more power than press and platform combined. Socrates taught his great truths not from public rostrums but in personal converse. Men made pilgrimages to Goethe's library and Coleridge's home to be charmed and instructed by their speech, and the culture of many nations was immeasurably influenced by the thoughts that streamed out from those rich wellsprings. Most of the world-moving speeches are made in the course of conversation. Conferences of diplomats, business-getting arguments, decisions by boards of directors, considerations of corporate policy, all of which influence the political, mercantile, and economic maps of the world, are usually the results of careful, though informal, conversation. And the man whose opinions weigh in such crises is he who has first carefully pondered the words of both antagonist and protagonist. However important it may be to attain self-control in light social converse or about the family table, it is undeniably vital to have oneself perfectly in hand while taking part in a momentous conference. Then the hints that we have given on poise, alertness, precision of word, clearness of statement, and force of utterance with respect to public speech are equally applicable to conversation. The form of nervous egotism, for it is both, that suddenly ends in flusters just when the vital words need to be uttered, is the sign of coming defeat, for a conversation is often a contest. If you feel this tendency embarrassing you, be sure to listen to Holmes's advice. Quote, and when you stick on conversational burrs, don't strew your pathway with those dreadful errs. Unquote. Here bring your will into action, for your trouble is a wandering attention. You must force your mind to persist along the chosen line of conversation, and resolutely refuse to be diverted by any subject or happening that may unexpectedly pop up to distract you. To fail here is to lose effectiveness utterly. Concentration is the keynote of conversational charm and efficiency. The haphazard habit of expression that uses birdshot when a bullet is needed ensures missing the game, for diplomacy of all sorts rests upon the precise application of precise words, particularly, if one may paraphrase Talleyrand, in those crises when language is no longer used to conceal thought. We may frequently gain new light on old subjects by looking at word derivations, 
Conversation signifies in the original a turnabout exchange of ideas, yet most people seem to regard it as a monologue. Bronson Alcott used to say that many could argue but few converse. The first thing to remember in conversation, then, is that listening, respectful, sympathetic, alert listening, is not only due to our fellow converser, but due to ourselves. Many a reply loses its point because the speaker is so much interested in what he is about to say that it is really no reply at all, but merely an irritating and humiliating irrelevancy. Self-expression is exhilarating. This explains the eternal impulse to decorate totem poles and paint pictures, write poetry and expound philosophy. One of the chief delights of conversation is the opportunity it affords for self-expression. A good conversationalist who monopolizes all the conversation will be voted a bore because he denies others the enjoyment of self-expression while a mediocre talker who listens interestedly may be considered a good conversationalist because he permits his companions to please themselves through self-expression they are praised who please they please who listen well the first step in remedying habits of confusion in manner awkward bearing vagueness in thought and lack of precision in utterance is to recognize your faults if you are serenely unconscious of them, no one, least of all yourself, can help you. But once diagnose your own weaknesses, and you can overcome them by doing four things. 1. Will to overcome them, and keep on willing. 2. Hold yourself in hand by assuring yourself that you know precisely what you ought to say. If you cannot do that, be quiet until you are clear on this vital point. 3. Having thus assured yourself, cast out the fear of those who listen to you. They are only human, and will respect your words if you really have something to say, and say it briefly, simply, and clearly. 4. Have the courage to study the English language, until you are master of at least its simpler forms. Heading. Conversational Hints. Choose some subject that will prove of general interest to the whole group. Do not explain the mechanism of a gas engine at an afternoon tea, or the culture of hollyhocks at a stag party. It is not considered good taste for a man to bare his arm in public and show scars or deformities. It is equally bad form for him to flaunt his own woes, or the deformity of someone else's character. The public demands plays and stories that end happily. All the world is seeking happiness. They cannot long be interested in your ills and troubles. George Cohan made himself a millionaire before he was thirty by writing cheerful plays. One of his rules is generally applicable to conversation. Always leave them laughing when you say good-bye. Dynamite the I out of your conversation. Not one man in 907 can talk about himself without being a bore. The man who can perform that feat can achieve marvels without talking about himself, so the eternal eye is not permissible even in his talk. If you habitually build your conversation around your own interests, it may prove very tiresome to your listener. He may be thinking of bird dogs or dry fly fishing while you are discussing the fourth dimension or the merits of a cucumber lotion. The charming conversationalist is prepared to talk in terms of his listener's interest. If his listener spends his spare time investigating Guernsey cattle or agitating social reforms, the discriminating conversationalist shapes his remarks accordingly. Richard Washburn Child says he knows a man of mediocre ability who can charm men much abler than himself when he discusses electric lighting. The same man probably would bore and be bored if he were forced to converse about music or Madagascar. Avoid platitudes and hackneyed phrases. If you meet a friend from Keokuk on State Street or on Pike's Peak, it is not necessary to observe how small this world is after all this observation was doubtless made prior to the formation of pike's peak 
This old world is getting better every day. Fanner's wives do not have to work as hard as formerly. It is not so much the high cost of living as the cost of high living. Such observations as these excite about the same degree of admiration as is drawn out by the appearance of a 1903 model touring car. If you have nothing fresh or interesting, you can always remain silent. How would you like to read a newspaper that flashed out in bold headlines, Nice weather we are having, or daily gave columns to the same old material you had been reading week after week? Questions and Exercises 1. Give a short speech describing the conversational bore. 2. In a few words, give your idea of a charming converser. 3. What qualities of the orator should not be used in conversation? 4. Give a short humorous delineation of the conversational oracle. 5. Give an account of your first day at observing conversation around you. 6. Give an account of one day's effort to improve your own conversation. 7. Give a list of subjects you heard discussed during any recent period you may select. 8. What is meant by elastic touch in conversation? 9. Make a list of bromides, as Galette Burgess called those threadbare expressions which bore us to extinction, itself a bromide. 10. What causes a phrase to become hackneyed? 11. Define the words A. Trite B. Solecism C. Colloquialism D. Slang E. Vulgarism F. Neologism 12. What constitutes pretentious talk? End of section 31 Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com Section 32 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Appendix A. Fifty Questions for Debate. 1. Has labor unionism justified its existence? 2. Should all church printing be brought out under the union label? 3. Is the open shop a benefit to the community? 4. Should arbitration of industrial disputes be made compulsory? 5. Is profit-sharing a solution of the wage problem? 6. Is a minimum wage law desirable? 7. Should the eight-hour day be made universal in America? 8. Should the state compensate those who sustain irreparable business loss because of the enactment of laws prohibiting the manufacture and sale of intoxicating drinks? 9. Should public utilities be owned by the municipality? 10. Should marginal trading in stocks be prohibited? 11. Should the national government establish a compulsory system of old age insurance by taxing the incomes of those to be benefited? 12. Would the triumph of socialistic principles result in deadening personal ambition? 13. Is the presidential system a better form of government for the United States than the parliamental system? 14. Should our legislation be shaped toward the gradual abandonment of the protective tariff? 15. Should the government of the larger cities be vested solely in a commission of not more than nine men elected by the voters at large? 16. Should national banks be permitted to issue, subject to tax and government supervision, notes based on their general assets? 17. Should woman be given the ballot on the present basis of suffrage for men? 18. Should the present basis of suffrage be restricted? 19. Is the hope of permanent world peace a delusion? 20. 
should the united states send a diplomatic representative to the vatican twenty one should the powers of the world substitute an international police for national standing armies twenty two should the united states maintain the monroe doctrine twenty three should the recall of judges be adopted twenty four should the initiative and referendum be adopted as a national principle twenty five is it desirable that the national government should own all railroads operating in interstate territory twenty six is it desirable that the national government should own interstate telegraph and telephone systems twenty seven is the national prohibition of the liquor traffic an economic necessity twenty eight should the united states army and navy be greatly strengthened twenty nine should the same standards of altruism obtain in the relations of nations as in those of individuals thirty should our government be more highly centralized thirty one should the united states continue its policy of opposing the combination of railroads thirty two in case of personal injury to a workman arising out of his employment should his employer be liable for adequate compensation and be forbidden to set up as a defence a plea of contributory negligence on the part of the workman or the negligence of a fellow workman thirty three should all corporations doing an interstate business be required to take out a federal license thirty four should the amount of property that can be transferred by inheritance be limited by law thirty five should equal compensation for equal labor between women and men universally prevail thirty six does equal suffrage tend to lessen the interest of woman in her home thirty seven should the united states take advantage of the commercial and industrial weakness of foreign nations brought about by the war by trying to wrest from them their markets in central and south america thirty eight should teachers of small children in the public schools be selected from among mothers thirty nine should football be restricted to colleges for the sake of physical safety forty should college students who receive compensation for playing summer baseball be debarred from amateur standing forty one should daily school hours and school vacations both be shortened forty two should home study for pupils in grade schools be abolished and longer school hours substituted forty three should the honor system in examinations be adopted in public high schools forty four should all colleges adopt the self-government system for its students forty five should colleges be classified by national law and supervision and uniform entrance and graduation requirements maintained by each college in a particular class forty six should ministers be required to spend a term of years in some trade business or profession before becoming pastors forty seven is the y m c a losing its spiritual power forty eight is the church losing its hold on thinking people forty nine are the people of the united states more devoted to religion than ever fifty does the reading of magazines contribute to intellectual shallowness end of section thirty two recording by paul adams www.yawnguy.com Section 33 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwine. Section 33. Appendix B. 30 Themes for Speeches with source references for material one kinship a foundation stone of civilization the state woodrow wilson two initiative and referendum 
The Popular Initiative and Referendum, O. M. Barnes. 3. Reciprocity with Canada. Article in Independent, 53, 2874. Article in North American Review, 178, 205. 4. Is Mankind Progressing? Book of same title, M. M. Ballou. 5. Moses, the Peerless Leader. Lecture by John Lord in Beacon, Lights of History. Note, this set of books contains a vast store of material for speeches. 6. The Spoils System. Sermon by the Reverend Dr. Henry Van Dyke, reported in the New York Tribune, February 25, 1895. 7. The Negro in Business. Part 3. Annual Report of the Secretary of Internal Affairs, Pennsylvania, 1912. 8. Immigration and Degradation. Americans or Aliens. Howard B. Groves. 9. What is the theatre doing for America? The Drama Today, Charlton Andrews. 10. Superstition. Curiosities of Popular Custom, William S. Walsh. 11. The Problem of Old Age. Old Age Deferred, Arnold Lorand. 12. Who is the Tramp? Article in Century, 28.41. 13. Two Men Inside. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, R. L. Stevenson. 14. The Overthrow of Poverty. The Panacea for Poverty, Madison Peters. 15. Morals and Manners. A Christian's Habits, Robert E. Spear. 16. Jew and Christian. Jesus the Jew, Harold Weinstock. 17. Education and the Moving Picture. Article by J. Berg Asenwein in The Theatre of Science, Robert Grau. 18. Books as Food. Books and Reading, R. C. Cage and Alfred Harcourt. 19. What is a Novel? The Technique of the Novel, Charles F. Holm. 20. Modern Fiction and Modern Life. Article in Lippincott's, October 1907. 21. Our Problem in Mexico. The Real Mexico, Hamilton Fife. 22. The Joy of Receiving. Article in Woman's Home Companion, December 1914. 23. Physical Training versus College Athletics. Article in Literary Digest, November 28, 1914. 24. Cheer Up! The Science of Happiness, Jean Finot. 25. The Square Peg in the Round Hole. The Job, the Man and the Boss, Catherine Blackford and Arthur Newcomb. 26. The Decay of Acting. Article in Current Opinion, November 1914. 27. The Young Man and the Church. A Young Man's Religion, N. McGee Waters. 28. Inheriting Success. Article in Current Opinion, November 1914. 29. The Indian in Oklahoma. Article in Literary Digest, November 28, 1914. 30. Hate and the Nation. Article in Literary Digest, November 14, 1914. End of section 33. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 34 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. 
The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 34. Appendix C. Suggestive Subjects for Speeches. Footnote. It must be remembered that the phrasing of the subject will not necessarily serve for the title. With occasional hints on treatment. 1. Movies and Morals. 2. The Truth About Lying. The essence of truth-telling and lying. Lies that are not so considered. The subtleties of distinctions required. Examples of implied and acted lies. 3. Benefits that follow disasters. Benefits that have arisen out of floods, fires, earthquakes, wars, etc. 4. Haste for leisure. How the speed mania is born of a vain desire to enjoy a leisure that never comes, or, on the contrary, how the seeming haste of the world has given men shorter hours of labour and more time for rest, study, and pleasure. 5. St. Paul's Message to New York. Truths from the Epistles pertinent to the great cities of today. 6. Education and Crime. 7. Loss is the mother of gain. How many men have been content until, losing all, they exerted their best efforts to regain success and succeeded more largely than before? 8. Egoism versus Egotism. 9. Blunders of young fogyism. 10. The waste of middlemen in charity systems. The cost of collecting funds for and administering help to the needy. The weakness of organized philanthropy as compared with the giving that gives itself. 11. The economy of organized charity. The other side of the picture. 12. Freedom of the press. The true forces that hurtfully control too many newspapers are not those of arbitrary governments, but the corrupting influences of moneyed and political interests, fear of the liquor power, and the desire to please sensation-loving readers. 13. Helen Keller, Optimist 14. Back to the Farm, A Study of the Reasons Underlying the Movement 15. It was ever thus. It ridiculed the pessimist who is never surprised at seeing failure. 16. The vocational high school. Value of direct training compared with the policy of laying broader foundations for later building. How the two theories work out in practice. Each plan can be especially applied in cases that seem to need special treatment. 17. All kinds of turning done here. A humorous, yet serious, discussion of the flopping windmill character. 18. The Egoistic Altruist. Herbert Spencer's theory is discussed in The Data of Ethics. 19. How the city menaces the nation. Economic perils in massed population. Show also the other side. Signs of the problems being solved. 20. The robust note in modern poetry. A comparison of the work of Galsworthy, Macefield and Kipling with that of some earlier poets. 21. The ideals of socialism. 22. The future of the small city. How men are coming to see the economic advantages of smaller municipalities. 23. Censorship for the theatre. Its relation to morals and art, its difficulties and its benefits. 24. For such a time as this. Mordecai's expression and its application to opportunities in modern woman's life. 25. Is the press venal? 26. Safety first. 27 means and extremes 28 rubicons and pontoons how great men not only made momentous decisions but created means to carry them out a speech full of historical examples 29 economy a revenue 
30. The patriotism of protest against popular idols. 31. Savonarola, the divine outcast. 32. The true politician. Revert to the original meaning of the word. Build the speech around one man as the chief example. 33. Colonels and shells. Leadership and cannon fodder. A protest against war in its effect on the common people. 34. Why is a militant? A dispassionate examination of the claims of the British militant suffragette. 35. Art and morals. The difference between the nude and the naked in art. 36. Can my country be wrong? False patriotism and true, with examples of popularly hated patriots. 37. Government by party. An analysis of our present political system and the movement toward reform. 38. The effects of fiction on history. 39. The effects of history on fiction. 40. The influence of war on literature. 41. Chinese Gordon, a eulogy. 42. Taxes and higher education. Should all men be compelled to contribute to the support of universities and professional schools? 43. Prize cattle versus prize babies. Is eugenics a science, and is it practicable? 44. Benevolent autocracy. Is a strongly paternal government better for the masses than a much larger freedom for the individual? 45. Second-hand opinions. The tendency to swallow reviews instead of forming one's own views. 46. Parentage or power? A study of which form of aristocracy must eventually prevail, that of blood or that of talent? 47. The blessing of discontent. Based on many examples of what has been accomplished by those who have not let well enough alone. 48. Corrupt and contented. A study of the relation of the apathetic voter to vicious government. 49. The Moloch of child labor. 50. Every man has a right to work. 51. Charity that fosters pauperism. 52. Not in our stars, but in ourselves. Destiny versus choice. 53. Environment versus heredity. 54. The bravery of doubt. Doubt, not mere unbelief. True grounds for doubt. What doubt has led to. Examples, the weakness of mere doubt. The attitude of the wholesome doubter versus that of the wholesale doubter. 55. The Spirit of Monticello. A message from the life of Thomas Jefferson. 56. Narrowness in Specialism. The dangers of specializing without first possessing broad knowledge. The eye too close to one subject. Balance is a vital prerequisite for specialization. 57. Responsibility of labor unions to the law. 58. The future of southern literature. What conditions in the history, temperament, and environment of our southern people indicate a bright literary future? 59. Woman, the hope of idealism in America. 60. The value of debating clubs. 61. An army of 30 millions in praise of the Sunday School. 62. The Baby. How the ever-new baby holds mankind in unselfish courses and saves us all from going lastingly wrong. 63. Lo, the poor capitalist, his trials and problems. 64. Honey and Sting, a lesson from the bee. 65. Ungrateful Republics. Examples from History. 66. Every man has his price. Horace Walpole's cynical remark is not true now, nor was it true even in his own corrupt era. Of what sort are the men who cannot be bought? 
examples. 67. The scholar in diplomacy. Examples in American life. 68. Locks and keys. There is a key for every lock. No difficulty so great, no truth so obscure, no problem so involved, but that there is a key to fit the lock. The search for the right key, the struggle to adjust it, the vigilance to retain it, these are some of the problems of success. 69. Right makes might. 70. Rooming with a ghost. Influence of the woman graduate of fifty years before on the college girl who lives in the room once occupied by the distinguished old grad. 71. No fact is a single fact. The importance of weighing facts relatively. 72. Is classical education dead to rise no more? 73. Invective against Nietzsche's philosophy. 74. Why have we bosses? A fair-minded examination of the uses and abuses of the political leader. 75. A plea for settlement work. 76. Credulity versus faith. 77. What is humour? 78. Use and abuse of the cartoon. 79. The pulpit in politics. 80. Are colleges growing too large? 81. The doom of absolutism. 82. Shall woman help keep house for town, city, state, and nation? 83. The educational test for suffrage. 84. The property test for suffrage. 85. The menace of the plutocrat. 86. The cost of high living. 87. The cost of conveniences. 88. Waste in American life. 89. The effect of the photoplay on the legitimate theatre. 90. Room for the kicker. There are no numbers 91 to 99. 100. The need for trained diplomats. 101. The shadow of the Iron Chancellor. 102. The tyranny of the crowd. 103. Is our trial by jury satisfactory? 104. The high cost of securing justice. 105. The need for speedier court trials. 106. Triumphs of the American Engineer. 107. Girthels and Gorgers. 108. Public education makes service to the public a duty. 109. Man owes his life to the common good. End of section 34. Recording by Paul Adams. www.yawnguy.com Section 35 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 35, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Newell Dwight Hillis, Brave Little Belgium. Delivered in Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, New York, October 18, 1914. Used by permission. Long ago, Plato made a distinction between the occasions of war and the causes of war. The occasions of war lie upon the surface and are known and read of all men while the causes of war are embedded in racial antagonisms, in political and economic controversies. Narrative historians portray the occasions of war, philosophic historians the secret and hidden causes. Thus the spark of fire that falls is the occasion of an explosion, 
but the cause of the havoc is the relation between charcoal, nitre, and saltpetre. The occasion of the Civil War was the firing upon Fort Sumter. The cause was the collision between the ideals of the Union, presented by Daniel Webster, and the succession taught by Calhoun. The occasion of the American Revolution was the stamp tax. The cause was the conviction, on the part of our forefathers, that men who had freedom in worship carried also the capacity for self-government. The occasion of the French Revolution was the purchase of a diamond necklace for Queen Marie Antoinette at a time when the treasury was exhausted. The cause of the revolution was feudalism. Not otherwise, the occasion of the great conflict that is now shaking our earth was the assassination of an Austrian boy and girl. But the cause is embedded in racial antagonisms and economic competition. As for Russia, the cause of the war was her desire to obtain the Bosphorus and an open seaport, which is the prize offered for her attack upon Germany. As for Austria, the cause of the war is her fear of the growing power of the Balkan states and the progressive slicing away of her territory. As for France, the cause of the war is the instinct of self-preservation that resists an invading host. As for Germany, the cause is her deep-seated conviction that every country has a moral right to the mouth of its greatest river, unable to compete with England by roundabout sea routes and a keel canal she wants to use the route that nature digged for her through the mouth of the rhine as for england the motherland is fighting to recover her sense of security during the napoleonic wars the second william pitt explained the quadrupling of the taxes the increase of the navy and the sending of an english army against france by the statement that justification of this proposed war is the preservation of England's sense of security. Ten years ago, England lost her sense of security. Today she is not seeking to preserve, but to recover the lost sense of security. She proposes to do this by destroying Germany's ironclads, demobilizing her army, wiping out her forts, and the partition of her provinces. The occasions of the war vary with the color of the paper, white and gray and blue, but the causes of this war are embedded in racial antagonisms and economic and political differences. Why Little Belgium Has the Center of the Stage Tonight our study concerns Little Belgium, her people, and their part in this conflict. Be the reasons what they may, this little land stands in the center of the stage and holds the limelight. Once more David, armed with a sling, has gone up against ten Goliaths. It is an amazing spectacle, this, one of the smallest of the states battling with the largest of the giants. Belgium has a standing army of 42,000 men, and Germany, with three reserves, perhaps 7 million or 8 million. Without waiting for any assistance, this little Belgian band went up against 2 million. It is as if a honey bee had decided to attack an eagle come to loot its honeycomb. It is as if an antelope had turned against a lion. Belgium has but 11,000 square miles of land, less than the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Her population is 7,500,000, less than the single state of New York. You could put 22 Belgiums in our single state of Texas. Much of her soil is thin. Her handicaps are heavy. But the industry of her people has turned the whole land into one vast flower and vegetable garden. The soil of Minnesota and the Dakotas is new soil, and yet our farmers there average but 15 bushels of wheat to the acre. 
Belgium soil has been used for centuries, but it averages 37 bushels of wheat to the acre. If we grow 24 bushels of barley on an acre of ground, Belgium grows 50. She produces 300 bushels of potatoes, where the main farmer harvests 90 bushels. Belgium's average population per square mile has risen to 645 people. If Americans practiced intensive farming, if the population of Texas were as dense as it is in Belgium, 100 million of the United States, Canada, and Central America could all move to Texas. While if our entire country was as densely populated as Belgium's, everybody in the world could live comfortably within the limits of our country. The life of the people. And yet little Belgium has no gold or silver mines, and all the treasures of copper and zinc and lead and anthracite and oil have been denied her. The gold is in the heart of her people. No other land holds a race more prudent, industrious, and thrifty. It is a land where everybody works. In the winter, when the sun does not shine until half-past seven, the Belgian cottages have lights in their windows at five, and the people are ready for an eleven-hour day. As a rule, all children work after twelve years of age. The exquisite pointed lace that has made Belgium famous is wrought by women who fulfill the tasks of the household fulfilled by American women, and then begins their task upon the exquisite lace that have sent their name and fame throughout the world. Their wages are low, their work hard, but their life is so peaceful and prosperous that few Belgians ever emigrate to foreign countries. Of late they have made their education compulsory, their schools free. It is doubtful whether any other country has made a greater success of their system of transportation. You will pay fifty cents to journey some twenty-odd miles out to Roslin on our Long Island Railroad. But in Belgium, a commuter journeys twenty miles into the factory and back again every night and makes the six double daily journeys at an entire cost of thirty-seven and one-half cents per week, less than the amount that you pay for the journey one way for a like distance in this country. Out of this has come Belgium's prosperity. She has the money to buy goods from other countries, and she has the property to export to foreign lands. Last year, the United States, with its hundred millions of people, imported less than two thousand million dollars, and exported two thousand five hundred million dollars. If our people had been as prosperous per capita as Belgium, we would have purchased from other countries twelve thousand million dollars worth of goods, and exported ten thousand million dollars. So largely have we been dependent upon Belgium that many of the engines used in digging the Panama Canal came from the cockerel works that produced two thousands of these engines every year in Liège. It is often said that the Belgians have the best courts in existence. The Supreme Court of Little Belgium has but one justice. Without waiting for an appeal, just as soon as the decision has been reached by a lower court, while the matters are still fresh in mind and all the witnesses and facts readily obtainable, this supreme justice reviews all the objections raised on either side, and without a motion from anyone, passes on the decision of the inferior court. On the other hand, the lower courts are open to an immediate settlement of disputes between the wage earners, and newsboys and fishermen are almost daily seen going to the judge for a decision regarding a dispute over five or ten cents, 
when the judge has cross-questioned both sides without the presence of attorneys or the necessity of serving a process or raising a dollar and a quarter as here the poorest of the poor have their wrongs righted it is said that not one decision out of one hundred is appealed thus calling for the existence of an attorney to all other institutions organized in the interest of the wage earner has been added the national savings bank system that makes loans to men of small means that enables the farmer and the working man to buy a little garden and build a house while at the same time insuring the working man against accident and sickness belgium is a poor man's country it has been said because institutions have been administered in the interest of the men of small affairs the great belgian plain in history but the institutions of belgium and the industrial prosperity of her people alone are not equal to the explanation of her unique heroism long ago in his commentaries julius caesar said that gaul was inhabited by three tribes the belgae the aquitani the celts of whom the belgae were the bravest history will show that belgians have courage as their native right for only the brave could have survived the southeastern part of belgium is a series of rock plains and if these plains have been her good fortune in times of peace they have furnished the battlefields of western europe for two thousand years northern france and western germany are rough jagged and wooded but the belgian plains were ideal battlefields for this reason the generals of germany and of france have usually met and struggled for the mastery on these wide belgian plains on one of these grounds julius caesar won the first battle that is recorded then came king clovis and the french with their campaigns toward these plains also the saracens were hurrying when assaulted by charles martel on the belgian plains the dutch burghers and the spanish armies led by bloody alva fought out their battle hither too came napoleon and the great mound of waterloo is the monument to the duke of wellington's victory it was to the belgian plains also that the german general last august rushed his troops every college and every city searches for some level spot of land where the contest between opposing teams may be held and for more than two thousand years the belgian plain has been the scene of the great battles between the warring nations of western europe now out of all these collisions there has come a hardy race inured to peril rich in fortitude loyalty patience thrift self-reliance and persevering faith for five hundred years the belgian children and youth have been brought up upon the deeds of noble renown achieved by their ancestors if julius caesar were here today he would wear belgium's bravery like a bright sword girded to his thigh and when this brave little people with a standing army of forty two thousand men single-handed defied two millions of germans it tells us that ajax has come back once more to defy the god of lightnings a thrilling chapter from belgium's history perhaps one or two chapters torn from the pages of belgium history will enable us to understand her present-day heroism just as one golden bough plucked from the forest will explain the richness of the autumn you remember that venice was once the financial center of the world then when the bankers lost confidence in the navy of venice they put their jewels and gold into saddlebags and moved the financial center of the world to nuremberg 
because its walls were seven feet thick and twenty feet high. Later, about 1500 A.D., the discovery of the New World turned all the peoples into races of sea-going folk, and the English and Dutch captains vied with the sailors of Spain and Portugal. No captains were more prosperous than the mariners of Antwerp. In 1568 there were 500 marble mansions in this city on the Meurs. Belgium became a casket filled with jewels. Then it was that Spain turned covetous eyes northward. Sated with his pleasures, broken by indulgence and passion, the Emperor Charles V resigned his gold and throne to his son, King Philip. Finding his coffers depleted, Philip sent the Duke of Alva, with 10,000 Spanish soldiers, out on a looting expedition. Their approach filled Antwerp with consternation, for her merchants were busy with commerce and not with war. The sack of Antwerp by the Spaniards makes up a revolting page in history. Within three days, 8,000 men, women, and children were massacred, and the Spanish soldiers, drunk with wine and blood, hacked, drowned, and burned like fiends that they were. The Belgian historian tells us that 500 marble residences were reduced to blackened ruins. One incident will make the event stand out. When the Spaniards approached the city, a wealthy burgher hastened the day of his son's marriage. During the ceremony, the soldiers broke down the gate of the city and crossed the threshold of the rich man's house. When they had stripped the guests of their purses and gems, unsatisfied, they killed the bridegroom, slew the men, and carried the bride out into the night. The next morning, a young woman, crazed and half-clad, was found in the street, searching among the dead bodies. At last she found a youth, whose head she lifted upon her knees, over which she crooned her songs, as a young mother soothes her babe. A Spanish officer passing by, humiliated by the spectacle, ordered a soldier to use his dagger and put the girl out of her misery. The Horrors of the Inquisition Having looted Antwerp, the treasure chest of Belgium, the Spaniards set up the Inquisition as an organized means of securing property. It is the strange fact that the Spaniard has excelled in cruelty as other nations have excelled in art or science or invention. Spain's cruelty to the Moors and the rich Jews forms one of the blackest chapters in history. Inquisitors became fiends. Moors were starved, tortured, burned, flung in wells. Jewish bankers had their tongues thrust through little iron rings. Then the end of the tongue was seared that it might swell, and a banker was led by a string in the ring through the streets of the city. The women and the children were put on rafts that were pushed out into the Mediterranean Sea. When the swollen corpses drifted ashore, the plague broke out. And when that black plague spread over Spain, it seemed like the justice of outraged nature. The expulsion of the Moors was one of the deadliest blows ever struck at science, commerce, art, and literature. The historian tracks Spain across the continents by a trail of blood. Wherever Spain's hand has fallen, it has paralyzed. From the days of Cortes, wherever her captains have given a pledge, the tongue that spake has been mildewed with lies and treachery. The wildest beasts are not in the jungle. Man is the lion that rends, man is the leopard that tears, man's hate is the serpent that poisons. 
and the Spaniard entered Belgium to turn a garden into a wilderness. Within one year, 1568, Antwerp, that began with 125,000 people, ended it with 50,000. Many multitudes were put to death by the sword and stake, but many, many thousands fled to England to begin anew their lives as manufacturers and mariners. And for years Belgium was one quaking peril, an inferno whose torturers were Spaniards. The visitor in Antwerp is still shown the rack upon which they stretched the merchants that they might yield up their hidden gold. The painted lady may be seen. Opening her arms, she embraces the victim. The Spaniard, with his spear, forced the merchant into the deadly embrace. As the iron arms concealed in velvet folded together, one spike passed through each eye, another through the mouth, another through the heart. The painted lady's lips were poisoned, so that a kiss was fatal. The dungeon whose sides were forced together by screws, so that each day the victim saw his cell growing less and less, and knew that soon he would be crushed to death, was another instrument of torture. Literally thousands of innocent men and women were burned alive in the marketplace. There is no more piteous tragedy in history than the story of the decline and ruin of this superbly prosperous literary and artistic country. And yet out of the ashes came new courage. Burned, broken, the Belgians and the Dutch were not beaten. Pushed at last into Holland, where they united their fortunes with the Dutch, they cut the dikes of Holland and let in the ocean and clinging to the dikes with their fingertips, fought their way back to the land. But no sooner had the last of the Spaniards gone than out of their rags and poverty they founded a university as a monument to the providence of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. For the sixteenth century, in the form of a brave knight, wears little Belgium and Holland like a red rose upon his heart. The death of Egmont. But some of you will say that the Belgian people must have been rebels and guilty of some excess, and that had they remained quiescent and not fermented treason, then no such fate could have overtaken them at the hands of Spain. Very well. I will take a youth who, at the beginning, believed in Charles V, a man who was as true to his ideals as the needle to the pole. One day the bloody council decreed the death of Egmont and Horn. Immediately afterward the Duke of Alva sent an invitation to Egmont to be the guest of honor at a banquet in his own house. A servant from the palace that night delivered to the Count a slip of paper containing a warning to take the fleetest horse and flee the city, and from that moment not to eat or sleep without pistols at his hand. To all this Egmont responded that no monster ever lived who could, with an invitation of hospitality, trick a patriot. Like a brave man, the Count went to the Duke's palace. He found the guests assembled, but when he had handed his hat and cloak to the servant, Alva gave a sign, and from behind the curtains came Spanish musketeers, who demanded his sword, for instead of a banquet hall, the Count was taken to a cellar, fitted up as a dungeon. Already Egmont had all but died for his country, he had used his ships, his trade, his gold for righting the people's wrongs. He was a man of a large family, a wife and eleven children, and people loved him as to idolatry. But Alva was inexorable. 
he had made up his mind that the merchants and burghers had still much hidden gold, and if he killed their bravest and best, terror would fall upon all alike, and that the gold he needed would be forthcoming. That all the people might witness the scene, he took his prisoners to Brussels and decided to behead them in the public square. In the evening, Egmont received the notice that his head would be chopped off the next day. A scaffold was erected in the public square. That evening, he wrote a letter that is a marvel of restraint. Sire, I have learned this evening the sentence which your majesty has been pleased to pronounce upon me. Although I have never had a thought, and believe myself never to have done a deed, which would tend to the prejudice of your service, or to the detriment of true religion, nevertheless I take patience to bear that which it has pleased the good God to permit. Therefore, I pray your majesty to have compassion on my poor wife, my children, and my servants, having regard to my past service, in which hope I now commend myself to the mercy of God. From Brussels, ready to die, this 5th of June, 1568, La Morale d'Egmont. Thus died a man who did as much probably for Holland as John Eliot for England, or Lafayette for France, or Samuel Adams for this young republic. The Woe of Belgium And now, out of all this glorious past, comes the Woe of Belgium. Desolation has come like the whirlwind, and destruction like a tornado. But ninety days ago, and Belgium was a hive of industry, and in the fields were heard the harvest songs. Suddenly, Germany struck Belgium. The whole world has but one voice. Belgium has innocent hands. She was led like a lamb to the slaughter. When the lover of Germany is asked to explain Germany's breaking of her solemn treaty upon the neutrality of Belgium, the German stands dumb and speechless. Merchants honor their written obligations. True citizens consider their word as good as their bond. Germany gave treaty, and in the presence of God and the civilized world, entered into a solemn covenant with Belgium. To the end of time, the German must expect this taunt as worthless as a German treaty. Scarcely less black, the two or three known examples of cruelty wrought upon non-resisting Belgians. In Brooklyn lives a Belgian woman. She planned to return home in late July to visit a father who had suffered paralysis, an aged mother, and a sister who nursed both. When the Germans decided to burn that village in eastern Belgium, they did not wish to burn alive this old and helpless man, so they bayoneted to death the old man and woman, and the daughter that nursed them. Let us judge not that we be not judged. This is the one example of atrocity that you and I might be able personally to prove. But every loyal German in the country can make answer, these soldiers were drunk with wine and blood. Such an atrocity misrepresents Germany and her soldiers. The breaking of Germany's treaty with Belgium represents the dishonest of a military ring, and not the perfidy of sixty-eight million of people. We ask that judgment be postponed until all the facts are in. But... Meanwhile, the man who loves his fellows at midnight in his dreams walks across the fields of broken Belgium. All through the night air there comes the sob of Rachel, weeping for her children because they are not. In moods of bitterness, of doubt and despair, the heart cries out, How could a just God permit such cruelty upon innocent Belgium? 
no man knows clouds and darkness are round about god's throne the spirit of evil calls this war but the spirit of god may bring good out of it just as the summer can repair the ravages of winter meanwhile the heart bleeds for belgium for brussels the third most beautiful city in europe for Louvain, once rich with its libraries, cathedrals, statues, paintings, missals, manuscripts, now a ruin. Alas for the ruined harvests and the smoking villages. Alas for the cathedral that is a heap and the library that is a ruin. Where the angel of happiness was there, stalk famine and death gone the land of grotius perished the paintings of rubens ruined is levain where the wheat waved now the hillsides are billowy with graves but let us believe that god reigns perchance belgium is slain like the savior that militarism may die like satan without shedding of innocent blood there is no remission of sins through tyranny and greed there is no wine without the crushing of the grapes from the tree of life soon liberty god's dear child will stand within the scene and comfort the desolate falling upon the great world's altar stairs in this hour when wisdom is ignorance and the strongest man clutches at dust and straw let us believe with faith victorious over tears that some time god will gather broken-hearted little belgium into his arms and comfort her as a father comforteth his well-beloved child end of section thirty five Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com Section 36 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwine. Section 36, Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. Henry Watterson. The New Americanism. Abridged. Eight years ago tonight, there stood where I am standing now a young Georgian who, not without reason, recognized the significance of his presence here, and in words whose eloquence I cannot hope to recall, appealed from the New South to New England for a united country. He is gone now, but, short as his life was, its heaven-born mission was fulfilled, the dream of his childhood was realized, for he had been appointed by God to carry a message of peace on earth, good will to men, and, this done, he vanished from the sight of mortal eyes, even as the dove from the ark. Grady told us, and told us truly, of that typical American who, in Dr. Talmadge's mind's eye, was coming, but who, in Abraham Lincoln's actuality, had already come. In some recent studies into the career of that man, I have encountered many startling confirmations of this judgment, and from that rugged trunk, drawing its sustenance from gnarled roots, interlocked with cavalier sprays and Puritan branches deep beneath the soil, shall spring, is springing, a shapely tree, symmetric in all its parts, under whose sheltering boughs this nation shall have the new birth of freedom lincoln promised it and mankind the refuge which was sought by the forefathers when they fled from oppression thank god the axe the gibbet and the stake have had their day they have gone let us hope to keep company with the lost arts 
it has been demonstrated that great wrongs may be redressed and great reforms be achieved without the shedding of one drop of human blood that vengeance does not purify but brutalizes and that tolerance which in private transactions is reckoned a virtue becomes in public affairs a dogma of the most far-seeing statesmanship so i appeal from the men in silken hose who danced to music made by slaves and called it freedom from the men in bell-crowned hats who led hester prynne to her shame and called it religion to that americanism which reaches forth its arms to smite wrong with reason and truth secure in the power of both i appeal from the patriarchs of new england to the poets of new england from endicott to lowell from winthrop to longfellow from norton to holmes and i appeal in the name and by the rights of that common citizenship of that common origin back of both the puritan and the cavalier to which all of us owe our being let the dead past consecrated by the blood of its martyrs not by its savage hatreds darkened alike by kingcraft and priestcraft let the dead past bury its dead let the present and the future ring with the song of the singers blessed be the lessons they teach the laws they make blessed be the eye to see the light to reveal blessed be tolerance sitting ever on the right hand of god to guide the way with loving word as blessed be all that brings us nearer the goal of true religion true republicanism and true patriotism distrust of watchwords and labels shams and heroes belief in our country and ourselves it was not cotton mather but john greenleaf whittier who cried dear god and father of us all forgive our faith in cruel lies forgive the blindness that denies cast down our idols overturn our bloody altars make us see thyself in thy humanity end of section thirty six recording by paul adams www.yawnguy.com section thirty seven of the art of public speaking this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 37. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. John Morley. Founder's Day Address. Abridged. Carnegie Institute, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. November 3, 1904. What is so hard as a just estimate of the events of our own time? It is only now, a century and a half later, that we really perceive that a writer has something to say for himself when he calls Wolfe's exploit at Quebec the turning point in modern history. And today, it is hard to imagine any rational standard that would not make the American Revolution, an insurrection of thirteen little colonies with a population of three millions scattered in a distant wilderness among savages, a mightier event in many of its aspects than the volcanic convulsion in France. Again, the upbuilding of your great west on this continent is reckoned by some the most important world movement of the last hundred years. But is it more important than the amazing, imposing, and perhaps disquieting apparition of Japan? One authority insists that when Russia descended into the Far East and pushed her frontier on the Pacific to the 43rd degree of latitude, that was one of the most far-reaching facts of modern history though it almost escaped the eyes of europe all her perceptions then monopolized by affairs in the levant 
who can say? Many courses of the sun were needed before men could take the full historic measures of Luther, Calvin, Knox, the measure of Loyola, the Council of Trent, and all the Counter-Reformation. The center of gravity is forever shifting, the political axis of the world perpetually changing. But we are now far enough off to discern how stupendous a thing was done when, after two cycles of bitter war, one foreign, the other civil and intestine, Pitt and Washington, within a span of less than a score of years, planted the foundations of the American Republic. What Forbes's stockade at Fort Pitt has grown to be, you know better than I. The huge triumphs of Pittsburgh in material production, iron, steel, coke, glass, and all the rest of it, can only be told in colossal figures that are almost as hard to realize in our minds as the figures of astronomical distance or geologic time. It is not quite clear that all the founders of the Commonwealth would have surveyed the wonderful scene with the same exultation as their descendants. Some of them would have denied that these great centers of industrial democracy, either in the old world or in the new, always stand for progress. Jefferson said, I view great cities as pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. I consider the class of artificers, he went on, as the pandas of vice, and the instrument by which the liberties of a country are generally overthrown. In England, they reckon 70% of our population as dwellers in towns. With you, I read that only 25% of the population live in groups as large as 4,000 persons. If Jefferson was right, our outlook would be dark. Let us hope that he was wrong, and in fact toward the end of his time qualified his early view. Franklin, at any rate, would, I feel sure, have reveled in it all. That great man a name in the forefront among the practical intelligences of human history, once told a friend that when he dwelt upon the rapid progress that mankind was making in politics, morals, and the arts of living, and when he considered that each one improvement always begets another, he felt assured that the future progress of the race was likely to be quicker than it had ever been. He was never wearied of foretelling inventions yet to come, and he wished he could revisit the earth at the end of a century to see how mankind was getting on. With all my heart I share his wish. Of all the men who have built up great states, I do believe there is not one whose alacrity of sound sense and single-eyed beneficence of aim could be more safely trusted than Franklin to draw light from the clouds and pierce the economic and political confusions of our time. We can imagine the amazement and complacency of that shrewd, benignant mind if he could watch all the great marvels of your mills and furnaces and all the apparatus devised by the wondrous inventive faculties of man if he could have foreseen that his experiments with the kite in his garden at philadelphia his tubes his laden jars would end in the electrical appliances of today the largest electric plant in all the world on the site of fort duquesne if he could have heard of five thousand millions of passengers carried in the united states by electric motor power in a year if he could have realized all the rest of the magician's tale of our time still more would he have been astounded and elated could he have foreseen beyond all advances in material production 
the unbroken strength of that political structure which he had so grand a share in rearing. Into this very region where we are this afternoon swept wave after wave of immigration. English from Virginia flowed over the border, bringing English traits, literature, habits of mind. Scots or Scots-Irish, originally from Ulster, flowed in from central Pennsylvania. Catholics from southern Ireland, new hosts from southern and east central Europe. This is not the 4th of July, but people of every school would agree that it is no exuberance of rhetoric, it is only sober truth to say that the persevering absorption and incorporation of all this ceaseless torrent of heterogeneous elements into one united, stable, industrious, and pacific state is an achievement that neither the Roman Empire nor the Roman Church, neither Byzantine Empire nor Russian, not Charles the Great, nor Charles the Fifth, nor Napoleon ever rivaled or approached. We are usually apt to excuse the slower rate of liberal progress in our old world by contrasting the obstructive barriers of prejudice, survival, solecism, anachronism, convention, institution, all so obstinately rooted even when the branches seem bare and broken in an old world, with the open and disengaged ground of the new. Yet in fact your difficulties were at least as formidable as those of the older civilizations, into whose fruitful heritage you have entered. Unique was the necessity of this gigantic task of incorporation, the assimilation of peoples of diverse faiths and race. A second difficulty was more formidable still, how to erect and work a powerful and wealthy state on such a system as to combine the centralized concert of a federal system with local independence, and to unite collective energy with the encouragement of individual freedom this last difficulty that you have so successfully up to now surmounted at the present hour confronts the mother country and deeply perplexes her statesmen liberty and union have been called the twin ideas of america so too they are the twin ideals of all responsible men in great britain although responsible men differ among themselves as to the safest path on which to travel toward the common goal, and the dividing ocean, in other ways so much our friend, interposes. For our case of an island state, or rather for a group of island states, obstacles from which a continental state like yours is happily altogether free. Nobody believes that no difficulties remain. Some of them are obvious. But the common sense, the mixture of patience and determination that has conquered risks and mischiefs in the past, may be trusted with the future. Strange and devious are the paths of history. Broad and shining channels get mysteriously silted up. How many a time what seemed a glorious high road proves no more than a mule track or mere cul-de-sac. Think of Canning's flashing boast when he insisted on the recognition of the Spanish republics in South America, that he had called a new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. This is one of the sayings of which sort many another might be found that make the fortune of a rhetorician, yet stand ill the wear and tear of time and circumstance. The new world that Canning called into existence has so far turned out a scene of singular disenchantment. Though not without glimpses on occasion of that heroism and courage and even wisdom that are the attributes of man almost at the worst, 
the tale has been too much a tale of anarchy and disaster. Still leaving a host of perplexities for statesmen both in America and Europe. It has left all social to students of a philosophic turn of mind one of the most interesting of all the problems to be found in the whole field of social, ecclesiastical, religious, and racial movement. Why is it that we do not find in the South, as we find in the North of this hemisphere, a powerful federation, a great Spanish-American people stretching from the Rio Grande to Cape Horn? To answer that question would be to shed a flood of light upon many deep historic forces in the old world, of which, after all, these movements of the new are but a prolongation and more manifest extension. What more imposing phenomenon does history present to us than the rise of Spanish power to the pinnacle of greatness and glory in the 16th century? The Mohammedans, after centuries of fierce and stubborn war, driven back. The whole peninsula brought under a single rule with a single creed. Enormous acquisitions from the Netherlands of Naples, Sicily, the Canaries, France humbled, England menaced, settlements made in Asia and Northern Africa. Spain in America become possessed of a vast continent and of more than one archipelago of splendid islands. Yet, before a century was over, the sovereign majesty of Spain underwent a huge declension. The territory under her sway was contracted. The fabulous wealth of the mines of the New World had been wasted. Agriculture and industry were ruined. Her commerce passed into the hands of her rivals. Let me digress one further moment. We have a very sensible habit in the island whence I come, when our country misses fire, to say as little as we can, and sink the thing in patriotic oblivion. It is rather startling to recall that less than a century ago, England twice sent a military force to seize what is now Argentina. Pride of race and hostile creed, vehemently resisting, proved too much for us. The two expeditions ended in failure, and nothing remains for the historian today but to wonder what a difference it might have made to the temperate region of South America if the fortunes of war had gone the other way, if the region of the Plata had become British, and a large British immigration had followed. Do not think me guilty of the heinous crime of forgetting the Monroe Doctrine. That momentous declaration was not made for a good many years after our General Whitelock was repulsed at Buenos Aires. Though Mr. Sumner and other people have always held that it was Canning who really first started the Monroe Doctrine when he invited the United States to join him against European intervention in South American affairs. The day is at hand, we are told, when four-fifths of the human race will trace their pedigree to English forefathers, as four-fifths of the white people in the United States trace their pedigree today. By the end of this century, they say, such nations as France and Germany, assuming that they stand apart from fresh consolidations, will only be able to claim the same relative position in the political world as Holland and Switzerland. These musings of the moon do not take us far. The important thing, as we all know, is not the exact fraction of the human race that will speak English. The important thing is that those who speak English, whether in old lands or new, shall strive in lofty, generous, and never-ceasing emulation with peoples of other tongues and other stock for the political, social, and intellectual primacy among mankind. In this noble strife for the service of our race, 
we need never fear that claimants for the prize will be too large a multitude as an able scholar of your own has said jefferson was here using the old vernacular of english aspirations after a free manly and well-ordered political life a vernacular rich in stately tradition and noble phrase to be found in a score of a thousand of champions in many camps in buchanan milton hooker locke jeremy taylor roger williams and many another humbler but not less strenuous pioneer and confessor of freedom ah do not fail to count up and count up often what a different world it would have been but for that island in the distant northern sea these were the tributary fountains that as time went on swelled into the broad confluence of modern time what was new in seventeen seventy six was the transformation of thought into actual polity what is progress it is best to be slow in the complex art of politics in their widest sense and not to hurry to define if you want a platitude there is nothing for supplying it like a definition or shall we say that most definitions hang between platitude and paradox there are said though i have never counted to be ten thousand definitions of religion there must be about as many of poetry there can hardly be fewer of liberty or even of happiness i am not bold enough to try a definition i will not try to gauge how far the advance of moral forces has kept pace with that extension of material forces in the world of which this continent conspicuous before all others bears such astounding evidence this of course is the question of questions because as an illustrious english writer to whom by the way i owe my friendship with your founder many long years ago as matthew arnold said in america here it is moral ideas that at bottom decide the standing or falling of states and nations without opening this vast discussion at large many a sign of progress is beyond mistake the practice of associated action one of the master keys of progress is a new force in a hundred fields and with immeasurable diversity of forms there is less acquiescence in triumphant wrong toleration in religion has been called the best fruit of the last four centuries and in spite of a few bigoted survivals even in our united kingdom and some savage outbreaks of hatred half religious half racial on the continent of europe this glorious gain of time may now be taken as secured perhaps of all the contributions of america to human civilization this is greatest the reign of force is not yet over and at intervals it has its triumphant hours but reason justice humanity fight with success their long and steady battle for a wider sway of all the points of social advance in my country at least during the last generation none is more marked than the change in the position of women in respect of rights of property of education of access to new callings as for the improvement of material well-being and its diffusion among those whose labor is a prime factor in its creation we might grow sated with the jubilant monotony of its figures if we did not take good care to remember in the excellent words of the president of harvard that those gains like the prosperous working of your institutions and the principles by which they are sustained are in essence moral contributions being principles of reason enterprise courage faith and justice over passion selfishness inertness timidity and distrust it is the moral impulses that matter 
where they are safe, all is safe. When this and the like is said, nobody supposes that the last word has been spoken as to the condition of the people either in America or Europe. Republicanism is not itself a panacea for economic difficulties. Of self, it can neither stifle nor appease the accents of social discontent. So long as it has no root in surveyed envy, this discontent itself is a token of progress. What, cries the skeptic, what has become of all the hopes of the time when France stood upon the top of golden hours? Do not let us fear the challenge. Much has come of them. And over the old hopes, time has brought a stratum of new. Liberalism is sometimes suspected of being called to these new hopes. And you may often hear it said that liberalism is already superseded by socialism. That a change is passing over party names in Europe is plain. But you can be sure that no change in name will extinguish these principles of society which are rooted in the nature of things and are accredited by their success. Twice America has saved liberalism in Great Britain. The war for independence in the 18th century was the defeat of usurping power no less in England than here. The war for union in the 19th century gave the decisive impulse to a critical extension of suffrage and an era of popular reform in the mother country. Any miscarriage of democracy here reacts against progress in Great Britain. If you seek the real meaning of most modern disparagement of popular or parliamentary government, it is no more than this and no politics will suffice of themselves to make a nation soar. What could be more true? Who says it will? But we may depend upon it that the soul will be best kept alive in a nation where there is the highest proportion of those who, in the phrase of an old worthy of the 17th century, think it a part of a man's religion to see to it that his country be well governed. Democracy, they tell us, is afflicted by mediocrity and by sterility. But has not democracy in my country, as in yours, shown before now that it well knows how to choose rulers, neither mediocre nor sterile, men more than the equals in unselfishness, in rectitude, in clear sight, in force, of any absolutist statesman that ever in times past bore the scepter? If I live a few months, or it may be even a few weeks longer, I hope to have seen something of three elections, one in Canada, one in the United Kingdom, and the other here. With us, in respect of leadership, and apart from height of social prestige, the personage corresponding to the President is, as you know, the Prime Minister. Our general election this time owing to personal accident of the passing hour, may not determine quite exactly who shall be the Prime Minister, but it will determine the party from which the Prime Minister shall be taken. On normal occasions, our election of a Prime Minister is as direct and personal as yours, and in choosing a Member of Parliament, people were really for a whole generation choosing whether Disraeli or Gladstone or Salisbury should be head of the government. The one central difference between your system and ours is that the American president is in for a fixed time, whereas the British prime minister depends upon the support of the House of Commons. If he loses that, his power may not endure a twelve-month. If, on the other hand, he keeps it, he may hold office for a dozen years. There are not many more interesting or important questions in political discussion than the question whether our cabinet government or your presidential system of government is the better. This is not the place to argue it. 
Between 1868 and now, a period of 36 years, we have had eight ministries. This would give us an average life of four and a half years. Of these eight governments, five lasted over five years. Broadly speaking, then, our executive governments have lasted about the length of your fixed term. As for ministers swept away by a gust of passion, I can only recall the overthrow of Lord Palmerston in 1858 for being thought too subservient to France. For my own part, I have always thought that by its free play, its comparative fluidity, its rapid flexibility of adaptation, our cabinet system has most to say for itself. Whether democracy will make for peace, we all have yet to see. So far, democracy has done little in Europe to protect us against the turbid whirlpools of a military age. And when the evils of rival states, antagonistic races, territorial claims, and all the other formulas of international conflict are felt to be unbearable, and the curse becomes too great to be any longer borne, a school of teachers will perhaps arise to pick up again the thread of the best writers and wisest rulers on the eve of the revolution. Movement in this region of human things has not all been progressive. If we survey the European courts from the end of the Seven Years' War down to the French Revolution, we note the marked growth of a distinctly international and pacific spirit. At no era in the world's history can we find so many European statesmen after peace, and the good government of which peace is the best ally. That sentiment came to violent end when Napoleon arose to scourge the world. End of section 37. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 38 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwine. Section 38, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Robert Toombs on Resigning from the Senate, 1861. Abridged. The success of the abolitionists and their allies, under the name of the Republican Party, has produced its logical results already. They have for long years been sowing dragon's teeth and have finally got a crop of armed men. The Union, sir, is dissolved. That is an accomplished fact in the path of this discussion that men may as well heed. One of your confederates has already wisely, bravely, boldly confronted public danger, and she is only ahead of many of her sisters because of her greater facility for speedy action. The greater majority of those sister states, under like circumstances, consider her cause as their cause. And I charge you in their name today, touch not Saguntum. It is not only their cause, but it is a cause which receives the sympathy and will receive the support of tens and hundreds of honest patriot men in the non-slaveholding states who have hitherto maintained constitutional rights and who respect their oaths, abide by compacts, and love justice. And while this Congress, this Senate, and this House of Representatives are debating the constitutionality and the expediency of seceding from the Union, and while the perfidious authors of this mischief are showering down denunciations upon a large portion of the patriotic men of this country, those brave men are coolly and calmly voting what you call revolution. I, sir, doing better than that, arming to defend it. 
They appeal to the Constitution, they appeal to justice, they appeal to fraternity, until the Constitution, justice, and fraternity were no longer listened to in the legislative halls of their country. And then, sir, they prepared for the arbitrament of the sword. And now you see the glittering bayonet, and you hear the tramp of armed men from your capital to the Rio Grande. It is a sight that gladdens the eyes and cheers the hearts of other millions ready to second them. Inasmuch, sir, as I have labored earnestly, honestly, sincerely with these men to avert this necessity so long as I deemed it possible, and inasmuch as I heartily approve their present conduct of resistance, I deem it my duty to state their case to the Senate to the country, and to the civilized world. Senators, my countrymen have demanded no new government. They have demanded no new constitution. Look to their records at home and from here, from the beginning of this national strife until its consummation in the disruption of the empire and they have not demanded a single thing except that you shall abide by the Constitution of the United States, that constitutional rights shall be respected, and that justice shall be done. Sirs, they have stood by your Constitution. They have stood by all its requirements. They have performed all its duties unselfishly, uncalculatingly, disinterestedly, until a party sprang up in this country which endangered their social system, a party which they arraign and which they charge before the American people and all mankind with having made proclamation of outlawry against 4,000 millions of their property in the territories of the United States with having put them under the ban of the empire in all the states in which their institutions exist outside the protection of federal laws, with having aided and abetted insurrection from within and invasion from without with the view of subverting those institutions and desolating their homes and their firesides. For these causes, they have taken up arms. I have stated that the discontented states of this Union have demanded nothing but clear, distinct, unequivocal, well-acknowledged constitutional rights, rights affirmed by the highest judicial tribunals of their country, rights older than the Constitution, rights which are planted upon the immutable principles of natural justice rights which have been affirmed by the good and the wise of all countries and of all centuries. We demand no power to injure any man. We demand no power to injure our Confederate States. We demand no right to interfere with their institutions, either by word or deed. We have no right to disturb their peace, their tranquility, their security. We have demanded of them simply, solely, nothing else, to give us equality, security, and tranquility. Give us these, and peace restores itself. Refuse them, and take what you can get. What do the rebels demand? First, that the people of the United States shall have an equal right to emigrate and settle in the present or any future acquired territories with whatever property they may possess, including slaves, and be securely protected in its peaceable enjoyment until such territory may be admitted as a state into the Union, with or without slavery, as she may determine on an equality with all existing states. That is our territorial demand. We have fought for this territory when blood was its price. We have paid for it when gold was its price. We have not proposed to exclude you, though you have contributed very little of blood or money. I refer especially to New England. 
We demand only to go into those territories upon terms of equality with you, as equals in this great confederacy, to enjoy the common property of the whole Union, and receive the protection of the common government, until the territory is capable of coming into the Union as a sovereign state, when it may fix its own institutions to suit itself. The second proposition is, that property in slaves shall be entitled to the same protection from the government of the United States in all of its departments everywhere, which the Constitution confers the power upon it to extend to any other property, provided nothing herein contained shall be construed to limit or restrain the right now belonging to every state to prohibit, abolish, or establish and protect slavery within its limits. We demand of the common government to use its granted powers to protect our property as well as yours. For this protection, we pay as much as you do. This very property is subject to taxation. It has been taxed by you and sold by you for taxes. The title to thousands and tens of thousands of slaves is derived from the United States. We claim that the government while the Constitution recognizes our property for the purposes of taxation, shall give it the same protection that it gives yours. Ought it not to be so? You say no. Every one of you upon the committee said no. Your senators say no. Your House of Representatives says no. Throughout the length and breadth of your conspiracy against the Constitution, there is but one shout of no. This recognition of this right is the price of my allegiance. Withhold it, and you do not get my obedience. This is the philosophy of the armed men who have sprung up in this country. Do you ask me to support a government that will tax my property, that will plunder me, that will demand my blood, and will not protect me? I would rather see the population of my native state laid six feet beneath her sod than they should support for one hour such a government. Protection is the price of obedience everywhere, in all countries. It is the only thing that makes government respectable. Deny it, and you cannot have free subjects or citizens. You may have slaves. We demand, in the next place, that persons committing crimes against slave property in one state and freeing to another shall be delivered up in the same manner as persons committing crimes against other property, and that the laws of the state from which such persons flee shall be the test of criminality. That is another one of the demands of an extremist and a rebel. But the non-slaveholding states, treacherous to their oaths and compacts, have steadily refused, if the criminal only stole a negro and that negro was a slave, to deliver him up. It was refused twice on the requisition of my own state as long as 22 years ago. It was refused by Kent and by Fairfield, governors of Maine, and representing, I believe, each of the then federal parties. We appealed then to fraternity, but we submitted. And this constitutional right has been practically a dead letter from that day to this. The next case came up between us and the state of New York, when the present senior senator, Mr. Seward, was the governor of that state, and he refused it. Why? He said it was not against the laws of New York to steal a Negro, and therefore he would not comply with the demand. He made a similar refusal to Virginia. Yet these are our confederates. These are our sister states. There is the bargain. There is the compact. You have sworn to it. Both these governors swore to it. The senator from New York swore to it. The governor of Ohio swore to it when he was inaugurated. You cannot bind them by oaths. Yet they talk to us of treason, and I suppose they expect to whip freemen into loving such brethren. They will have a good time in doing it. 
It is natural we would want this provision of the Constitution carried out. The Constitution says slaves are property. The Supreme Court says so. The Constitution says so. The theft of slaves is a crime. They are a subject matter of felonious asportation. By the text and letter of the Constitution, you agreed to give them up. You have sworn to do it, and you have broken your oaths. Of course, those who have done so look out for pretext. Nobody expected them to do otherwise. I do not think I ever saw a perjurer, however bald and naked, who could not invent some pretext to palliate his crime, or who could not for fifteen shillings hire an old Bailey lawyer to invent some for him. Yet this requirement of the Constitution is another one of the extreme demands of an extremist and a rebel. The next stipulation is that fugitive slaves shall be surrendered under the provisions of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 without being entitled either to a writ of habeas corpus or trial by jury or other similar obstructions of legislation in the state to which he may flee. Here is the Constitution. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. This language is plain, and everybody understood it the same way for the first forty years of your government. In 1793, in Washington's time, an act was passed to carry out this provision. It was adopted unanimously in the Senate of the United States and nearly so in the House of Representatives. Nobody then had invented pretexts to show that the Constitution did not mean a Negro slave. It was clear, it was plain, not only in the federal courts, but all the local courts in all the states decided that this was a constitutional obligation. How is it now? The North sought to evade it, following the instincts of their natural character. They commenced with the fraudulent fiction that fugitives were entitled to habeas corpus, entitled to trial by jury in the state to which they fled. They pretended to believe that our fugitive slaves were entitled to more rights than their white citizens. Perhaps they were right. They know one another better than I do. You may charge a white man with treason or felony or other crime, and you do not require any trial by jury before he is given up. There is nothing to determine but that he is legally charged with a crime and that he fled and then he is to be delivered up upon demand. White people are delivered up every day in this way, but not slaves. Slaves, black people, you say, are entitled to trial by jury, and in this way schemes have been invented to defeat your plain constitutional obligations. Senators, the Constitution is a compact. It contains all our obligations and the duties of the federal government. I am content and have ever been content to sustain it. While I doubt its perfection, while I do not believe it was a good compact, and while I never saw the day that I would have voted for it as a proposition de novo, yet I am bound to it by oath and by that common prudence which would induce men to abide by established forms rather than to rush into unknown dangers. I have given to it, and intend to give to it, unfaltering support and allegiance. But I choose to put that allegiance on the true ground, not on the false idea that anybody's blood was shed for it. I say that the Constitution is the whole compact. All the obligations, all the chains that fetter the limbs of my people are nominated in a bond, and they wisely excluded any conclusion against them by declaring that the powers not granted by the Constitution to the United States or forbidden by it to the states belong to the states respectively or the people. Now I will try it by that standard. I will subject it to that test. The law of nature, 
the law of justice would say, and it is so expounded by the publicists, that equal rights in the common property should be enjoyed. Even in a monarchy, the king cannot prevent the subjects from enjoying equality in the disposition of the public property. Even in a despotic government, this principle is recognized. It was the blood and the money of the whole people, says the learned Grotius, and say all the publicists, which acquired the public property, and therefore it is not the property of the sovereign. This right of equality being then, according to justice and natural equity, a right belonging to all states, when did we give it up? You say Congress has a right to pass rules and regulations concerning the territory and other property of the United States. Very well. Does that exclude those whose blood and money paid for it? Does dispose of mean to rob the rightful owners? You must show a better title than that, or a better sword than we have. What, then, will you take? You will take nothing but your own judgment. That is, you will not only judge for yourselves, not only discard the court, discard our construction, discard the practice of the government, but you will drive us out simply because you will it. Come and do it. You have sapped the foundations of society. You have destroyed almost all hope of peace. In a compact where there is no common arbiter, where the parties finally decide for themselves, the sword alone at last becomes the real, if not the constitutional, arbiter. Your party says that you will not take the decision of the Supreme Court. You said so at Chicago. You said so in committee. Every man of you in both houses says so. What are you going to do? You say we shall submit to your construction. We shall do it if you can make us, but not otherwise, or in any other manner. That is settled. You may call it secession, or you may call it revolution, but there is a big fact standing before you, ready to oppose you. That fact is... Freemen with arms in their hands. End of section 38. Recording by Paul Adams. www.yawnguy.com.